Hey there, I'm Ryan and welcome to today's acrylic landscape lesson. All of the tools and materials will be listed in the video description. And if you'd like help with the drawing process, I'll also have the traceable up over on Patreon along with the reference photo for color matching. With that said, this channel is predominantly fan funded. So if you feel like you're enjoying, you're having fun, you're learning things, do consider checking out the Patreon. We do have a lot of fun things up there on top of the reference photos and traceables like that of my eBooks and even a bunch of polls. So a bunch of fun stuff, do check it out if you're enjoying. But with that, let's jump into it and have some fun. We're going to begin here today with a nine by 12 inch canvas and a one inch flat headed brush. From there, I'll dip the bottom third into some water, condensing our bristles and ensuring that our paint does stay wet for a longer period of time. With that, on to step number one. So we're going to begin here today with a one inch flat headed brush and quite a bit of titanium white paint. From there, we'll grab about one fourth that in our ultramarine blue and start mixing that up fairly consistently. Right now we're looking to mix a color for the top of our sky. And I go into my reference photo, I do a little test and I quickly realize, you know what, it's a little bit too bright. So we add some Mars black to that mixture, of course mix it up and you do want to mix it fairly well. That way you don't have little portions of your brush that are a little bit brighter, a little bit darker. Do ensure that your mix is you know, well mixed. And from there, we do go back to the reference photo and I can see, you know what, we're getting closer, but it did get a little bit too dark and maybe a little bit too desaturated. And that happens when you're mixing a lot of white and black together, right? They make a gray and they take away from the hue of whatever other color you're using. So we brighten it up a little bit, then we interject the blue and we find the correct color for that top left-hand side of the sky. Now we go in to mix a different color for our clouds. And this is for the higher clouds in the sky. They're a bit distant. We're using quite a bit of our uh, deep violet, our Mars black, our titanium white. And this again is for the higher clouds. We're going to have lower, more so orange clouds on top of this. And this is going to really move about quite a bit in the painting. So you can see that I'm testing it in a couple of different areas, but I'd recommend predominantly, if you're using the reference photo here, going for the one that's right above the top of the orange, as that's going to give us the best view, the, the best interpretation of what the majority of it is going to look like. So we started off with quite a lot of mixing in the beginning of this one. Generally like to keep it pretty easy, but you are going to have to mix quite a few colors in this lesson and they do matter. So I just, I wanted to start it off that way. And now we're jumping into the actual painting process. I'm grabbing an abundance of that fairly grayed, relatively light blue that we have. And I'm throwing that everywhere in the sky with the exception of where our prominent, more so purple clouds are going to be. I'm using an X shaped pattern to really move that paint both up and down on the canvas. And then I go back over it with a horizontal stroke, very soft to take out any of the brush strokes or line work. Generally, the harder you press, the more brush strokes you render. So going over it again at the end with a softer application is generally great for skies. Now this lesson for the most part will be in real time, but I did speed up a couple of the more so repetitive parts. That way you don't have to watch me paint in a blue sky for 10 or so minutes. So with that, here you can see things happening a little bit more quickly. I am trying to make the bottom portion slightly brighter, but with that, that is our sky and you're probably going to want to do two layers. Now, jumping into the second step, we are going to continue using that one inch flat headed brush. We're going to grab quite a bit of our purple, which again is a mixture of our deep violet, titanium white, and Mars black. We're going to apply the majority of our paint to the larger inner portion of our clouds where there's a lot of white canvas. And then we're going to slowly expand outwards towards the blue that we have. And we're doing this very specifically because we don't want to blend too much purple into the sky and expand our cloud greatly. And if we apply a lot of paint along the edge, then we definitely run into that issue. So what I'm trying to do is get the majority of the paint off in a 
area of the canvas that is still very much white and not so close to the blue. And then I take what's left on the brush and I use that to blend in the blue. Now the blue is still quite wet because we are using a damp brush. That water in the brush is going to extend the wet life of our paint, make blending a lot easier. Generally a really nice thing when you're working on clouds and our skies. So just again, something to keep in mind. And here you can see I'm using that excess paint on the edges to blend into that blue. Again, really moving the brush with as little pressure as possible, trying to avoid those brush strokes and just keep everything quite clean. Then I take some of that extra purple and I work it up around the top right hand side of our canvas. Then with a very soft touch, I move over it with a bit of an X shaped pattern. This softens all of it very nicely. And now we have these distant purple clouds. They're very high in the sky. They're fairly semi-transparent and they add some diversity to the larger, more so blocky cloud that we have in the center of the painting. Again, the majority of this lesson will be in real time, but this was a little repetitive, so I thought I'd speed it up and show it to you with a bit more brevity. With that, I am going back and I'm doing a couple of layers, though on the top here, I do notice that things are starting to dry a little bit and I'm not getting as smooth of an application as I was before. This will happen. If it does, you can add a little bit more water to your brush or you can do what I'm about to do here. I apply some purple to the edge of my cloud. Then I decide to take off the purple from my brush. I grab more of the blue, which we were previously working with and I blend that into the side of the cloud. Now we have wet into wet. We can blend that purple into that blue. It looks nice, it looks soft, and it's a great way of working around that. So again, multiple ways of going about it. It really comes down to personal preference, but right now we're just working on this very high up, distant, more so purple cloud, which isn't receiving all that much light. Now we're going to switch to the Filbert brush, which has slightly rounded edges, which is fantastic for rendering softer applications, which is especially prominent in subjects like clouds. Now here I'm going to be grabbing a little bit of our ultramarine blue, about double that titanium white, and then just a hint of our deep violet as well. Now I'm going to grab a even smaller amount of our Mars black, and I try to use very minimal amounts of that initially because it's just such a prominent pigment. And then I jump into the canvas and start working on some additional smaller clouds up to the top right hand side of our painting. And as you can see, these are barely noticeable and that is very much the goal here. I wanted to start with something incredibly subtle and slowly layer on these very transparent clouds. We are going to be working on much more prominent clouds, orange ones, golden ones, ones that have a lot of color and saturation, but those are farther down in the sky. Those are catching a lot of light and they are blocking these areas from receiving it. So here, we are working on something that's much more subtle that is meant to complement the painting. I'm just slowly adding to this detail. And the majority of them, as you can see, are odd shapes, but they have a bit of movement in them, which moves in the same direction. It implies a certain you know, direction of wind, and it also creates a leading line, and that kind of takes the eye from the top of the painting down into the middle section, and that's really what we're attempting to do with these subjects. Though I am trying to keep the edges quite soft and I'm doing so by working very softly along the edges and just slightly blending them out so that again the middle is the most opaque and then as you get towards the edges it gets softer and softer. So there's a lot of little techniques to creating these little clouds. Again trying to get the color relatively close to the sky but with a hint of purple is a great way of going about it getting those really soft edges, that's important. Ensuring that they're always a slightly different shape than the other ones is also going to get you pretty far. And then once I have a fair number of them, I start to combine them as well. I'm creating this almost longer horizontal piece and that's a great way of diversifying once you feel like you've applied a lot of the different shapes that are you know, possible because then you open yourself up to whole new possibilities, brand new leading lines. And with that, I think that's a pretty good start.
Now, our next step, we definitely need to clean our brushes because we have some blue on there, we have some purple, and we don't want that mixing in to our next color, which is a cadmium yellow deep hue. We are going to grab quite a lot of that. We're going to grab about half that in our cadmium red medium hue, and we're going to test that in the middle of our cloud. I realized that it's a bit too saturated, it's a bit too dark, so we add in some extra titanium white. I also want it to be slightly more orange orange again, so we add in the red, and then I grab just the smallest amount, sorry that's cut off, of burnt umber just to give it a slightly earthy look, it darkens it, but it doesn't run the risk of turning it green like a Mars black would, and that right there looks fantastic for the middle orange. Again, we don't want the brightest orange at this point. We don't want the golden yellow. We don't want the darkest of it. We want something that we can place in there as a base layer and then build on top of, something that we can darken and lighten. So I was looking for the most common orange within the reference photo, and now that we have it, I'm working predominantly on the white areas of the canvas to get the majority of my paint off, much like we did with the purple clouds. And then once we have very minimal amounts, we can get to a bit of a blending effect. But already, I think you can tell that the purple and the orange look quite nice together. That's always important as these are both going to be pretty dominant colors. Though I would like to note that we are going to be covering up quite a bit of the purple with the orange. So if you feel like your purple area was a little bit rough, you can still see some brush strokes. Don't worry about that. You will have plenty of opportunities to cover it up and make sure that it looks exactly how you want. Now over to the right hand side here, I'm doing this really interesting blending effect. I'm using the edge of the brush so that I can get some line work, but you can see that the cloud moves up in all of these different directions and kind of flares out. It almost looks like a patch of grass on a very windy day, but it definitely adds a unique element to what we're working on. Then I start to expand upwards here, and this is all in the traceable. You can see it in the reference photo, so don't worry about getting lost if you're working with those. If not, just kind of follow along, but we are going to start expanding on this cloud and this is something you can draw back in from the initial shot of the painting that I included or again using using either of the resources but I am going to start adding in some smaller clouds much like we did with the purple however this time they are going to be with this new color and we need to ensure that it's fairly thick because we really don't want any of the white canvas showing through we want this to be nice and professional and we also don't want the purple to show through too much, especially with these prominent clouds. We will have semi-transparent ones a little bit later on in the painting process. Here, I'm also throwing in some horizontal clouds, as you can see, and that's really to continue diversifying the type of cloud we have, the movement, and just ensuring that it as a whole is continuously captivating. So, so far, so good. I think that we have some really unique and interesting shapes. The left and the right hand side do look different. The middle extends upwards. It's dynamic. And now we're going to take a minimal amount of paint with our damp brush and I'm going to softly blend up my applications predominantly here on the left side. So here you can see I'm using a bit of a swishing motion. I'm raising the brush, I'm relieving pressure, that way it gets softer, that way we get more of a transparent application, that way we can see the purple through the yellowish orange very specifically on the edges and it does give it a really nice soft warm look though you can always go back and add more of that orange if you feel like you're thinning it out a little bit too much here we're even doing that with our smaller horizontal clouds and i do want to keep the base of them relatively sharp then have the top area blend and feather to a much greater degree it's just going to make it look much more natural if you have both of those effects going on simultaneously now here we're going back and you can see from a bit more of a distance how i'm going about this blending process there is a lot of that x shape pattern really dragging the paint up in the general motion of the clouds and how they're moving and then i'm also just tapping in an extra one as well 
Now we're going to be switching to a round headed brush and we're going to do so because the softer edges are going to make feathering clouds a whole lot easier. When we were working with the one inch flat headed brush, we had to work around the fact that it had these sharp corners and we don't have to do this here. So we'll be able to render some really nice gradients and because it has a smaller tip, we'll also be able to create some nice detail as well. So it's quite versatile, especially when working on clouds. And as you can see, we are starting to stretch out from that bottom warm area and the farther we get away from that, the closer we get to the top of the canvas, the more applications are going to become semi-transparent because we're moving farther and farther away from the light and these are offshoot clouds which aren't as dense as the larger ones that we have at the bottom. So I have slightly more water in my brush to ensure that it isn't rendering all of these opaque applications, though I am trying to keep the base of the clouds, again, slightly sharper, slightly more opaque, and then they soften as we get towards the top. I'm also taking this opportunity to fill out some of the bodies of clouds just to ensure that they are nice and thick again. You really don't want any of the white canvas showing through. Now, we've given that initial area a little bit of time to dry, so I go back, I thicken that, but I leave the tops to be fairly transparent and to still have that gradient which is going to give us a lot of depth, which is going to give the clouds diversity and make it all quite interesting. So here you can see I'm going back, I'm fixing things. If you overdo it, don't worry. You can always let it dry, wait five minutes and paint the purple clouds on top of it, then let that dry, then come back and work on the softer ones yet again. Now here you can see that I'm kind of grinding my brush into the canvas a little bit to render a bit of a soft look on these once hard top edges. It's not something I generally advise because it can rip paint out of an area where you want it and then leave thin layers, but the majority of the paint had dried at that point and I'm really just trying to get a bit of a softer effect. So sometimes it's okay to break those rules though that generally isn't a technique I'd advise. I'm also now moving up to that top right hand side of the painting again and up there I do a couple little taps very similar to what we were doing with the purple earlier continuing that same pattern but I'm not neglecting the left hand side either and we are softening this really nice little addition as well though one side is going to be slightly less detailed that way it isn't overwhelming just something to think about. Now we're going to add some additional red into our mixture here, make it a bit more pink based. There I did just to dip my brush in slightly more water and we can head back into our painting. We are going to be changing the colors in our clouds slightly and this is meant to be a little bit warmer and a little bit more red. I'm going to apply this to the tops of all of my clouds. It is again a bit more watery, therefore it's going to be slightly more transparent. It'll blend up into the purple really nicely. And purple has a combination of red and blue. That's how you mix it, that's how you make it. So by having a slightly more red orange touch the purple, then we're going to have a more natural transition into that pigment. And that's really what we're creating here. From a distance, I think it looks really, really wonderful and something we're going to continue to apply throughout the painting. But we essentially want the top of the clouds to be the most transparent, but also the most red. Then as you move down the cloud through every portion of it, things get, again, more opaque, but also a little more orange, and then eventually a little more yellow, and then eventually a little more yellowish titanium white. So there's a real transition and there's a real pattern to what we're doing, despite the fact that we have multiple pieces to our clouds, and despite the fact that they're so separated from one another, because these are all essentially on the same plane. They are all the same height, right? We have the higher, purple clouds, which aren't receiving the light. And while this stretches out, while it gets towards us, while it goes towards the right and left, for the most part, it is at the same height throughout, you know, the entirety of the land. So we are giving all of the clouds for the most part, the same treatment. 
And with that here, I'm yet again using my finger to soften that. I'm going to use this more reddish orange as a bit of a base layer to build on top of. We can go back and we add a bit of more orangey yellow to the base of it later on to further add additional clouds. And so this is a great opportunity to add clouds if you feel like your sky was a little bit bare initially. Here you can also, again, I, I keep talking about the finger painting. It's something that I never really grew out of. It's something I'm still a big fan of, and it's a great way of creating these softer clouds in the background here, as you can see. They're just so subtle, and it's a very easy way of making the top portion uh, again just a lot softer so this is really going to be a process we are building up these layers in the clouds though I do recommend if you use your finger as I have been make sure that it is very very clean that you don't have any natural oils uh, kind of built up on your finger because if you do then you may make that portion of the painting resistant to water and watery paint so you'll kind of find yourself in an odd spot where you move that paint out but then you can't really add any more on top of it so just make sure that your hands are very clean if you decide to do that and I do recognize that at this point things are looking a little messy don't worry that's just part of the process that is acrylic painting that is layering though we do end up bringing it to a really nice place so with that I do use more of that orange to continue to craft more of these little clouds out then I do grab more of the orange to expand on the bottom portions again lifting that up into the purple of the sky just trying to create these softer looks and I'm very slowly expanding on our amount of orange clouds as you can tell I'm bouncing around I'm not hyper focusing on a singular area and I'm just trying to ensure that it all very much naturally progresses together because it's really easy to hyper focus on one area add a whole lot of detail and then kind of force yourself to add it to other areas so that it all balances and that's why I like to kind of move around as much as I do but here now I mixed a combination of the more yellow orange and the more red orange and I'm putting that in between to act as a nice little blend and this is really what makes a lot of it look a lot less messy so yeah definitely definitely turning out well Now we're going to jump back into our palette with quite a bit of titanium white, about an equal mixture of cadmium yellow deep hue, and then about half that with cadmium red medium hue. Then we'll test that in the brighter portions of our clouds. I very quickly realized that it isn't quite bright enough, so I add some additional titanium white. We go for the test, and that's looking quite nice. So we'll grab that, and this is going to be the color which we apply to the very bottom of our clouds. This is where the majority of the light is going to be hitting and reflecting off. So we want to ensure that this is predominantly applied to the areas which we've left to be relatively sharp. Remember the bottom of the clouds sharp, the top much more soft and blended. So we're going to follow that for the most part. I'm also creating a lot of miniature strokes here, as you can see, just a lot of these cupping motions. And I do that so that it looks like there are all of these little bumps in the cloud, all of these little areas that kind of protrude downwards that catch light. It's going to give it some extra detail and dimension without making it look visually busy. So that is the primary goal here. Then we move down into the base of our cloud. And this is a fairly interesting area. I'm really just kind of copying the reference photo at this point. But as you get farther into the distance generally, and this goes the same for water and waves, subjects that initially look like they protrude on different angles visually kind of condense and have the look of being horizontal. So while the clouds that are closest to us you know, kind of move out in these very dynamic movements, the farther back we get, the more horizontal it starts to look as a whole at least. And so the majority of these applications are going to be moving in that general direction. Again, I very much like to preface, it's going to look messy for a little while. You just need to trust the process and trust yourself. I know so many people, so many people really want to learn to paint and they find themselves getting discouraged in the early 
portions of the painting when it doesn't look great but realistically that isn't it isn't their fault it's the medium and just how things go so make sure that you know <laughs> you're in a good mindset recognize that you can do this and that you know you look at the painting right here and mine looks messy but you've also seen the thumbnail and you know that we make it through that stage and it ends up looking great so don't worry about that if you are at that stage as well with that i am now working over to the left hand side and i found a couple little protruding areas will outstretch it a little bit at the top but not so much i i am hesitant to apply too too much to the areas that are on the top that are very dynamic because the light is coming from that bottom area and therefore the farther we get from that the darker things should be the less prominent those yellow highlights should be so we're just kind of keeping that in mind i'm going back i'm doing a lot of layering in this bottom area right and that's something that i definitely recommend you want this yellow to really build up in that spot the more layers you do the more natural the pigment will look it'll look more similar to what you actually have on the palette where when you apply it for the very first time because acrylics are semi-transparent you're probably going to see the orange and the red through it and you're not going to have that natural color that you've mixed so it does take a couple of layers and sometimes you are going to need to let it to dry a little bit before you can go in and apply that second or third layer so also keep that in mind but throughout this process do remember whenever you're crafting the bottom of a cloud make it a bit sharper and then blend it up into the top make it softer same goes for the oranges the same goes for the reds very much similar rules for different hues which all blend together and render really wonderful piece. Now, while we will be going back into the clouds, we're going to take a bit of a break, grab quite a lot of our titanium white, about one third that in our cadmium yellow, about one fifth that in our cadmium red, and we'll test that right in the open area of sky. I realize that it's still a bit too pigmented, needs to be brighter, so I add some additional titanium white. That looks a whole lot better. So from there, we do jump over into our canvas, and I start applying this in between our tree line and our clouds. So this is something that you could apply with the one inch flat headed brush covered all very quickly. I'm opting to still use the round headed brush because I want a slight blend up from this pigment into the base of our cloud. That way it has a bit of a diffused look. It looks a bit softer. Looks like that light is really moving up the back of it. And then I use this to actually work into those clouds. Though I'm going to be extremely sparing with it because it's extremely bright and it can definitely capture the eye's attention and keep it, but if we apply it to too many places, then the eye can kind of get confused. So we're going to be quite sparing with this, especially in the clouds. I'm going to ensure that the edges of the clouds are fairly soft with it, though when I start to move it up into the cloud and very specifically over the brightest areas, the areas that we just completed with yellow, I ensure that the bottom is still relatively sharp and then I do a softer blend upwards into the yellow. So following the same rule set as everything else, but this time just a brighter pigment. Now I am going to do a couple of layers with this. Again, we are working with yellow, which is typically with most brands a fairly transparent pigment and it does require more layers some colors require more layers some colors require less titanium white is actually quite thick and it'll balance out the yellow a little bit but just remember that it will look a lot better if you do add that extra time you do those extra layers now here i'm working my way up into the cloud and again going to be very sparing predominantly staying close to the bottom where the majority of that light is coming from and with that we can also you know continue to bounce around a little bit i decide not to do too much at any one point in time that way i can take steps back really look at the painting and discern if we need more and then where so right because it isn't always going to be the easiest answer and you might want to kind of think about, well, maybe we put it there. Maybe we put it there. 
you know, have these conversations with yourself and just kind of figure out where you want it. But I did find a couple of spots and I think that's looking pretty good. So with that, on to the next step. Now for our next step, we are going to want to ensure that our brushes are nice and clean because we are going back to blues and we don't want them mixing with the yellows previously worked with. Now I'm grabbing quite a bit of my ultramarine blue, about an equal mixture of our deep violet, then about double that in titanium white. Then we'll grab a little bit of Mars black again, not too much. And I do feel that that mixture is slightly too desaturated. So I add in some extra blue. And right now we are looking for a purple, which is very similar to what we used in the clouds previously. Now I do realize that it does need to be more desaturated. So I add in the extra Mars black and look at that, definitely did the trick, much, much more of a soft hue. Now we can take this and we can go back to working on our purple clouds. This time, however, doing a more subtle version of them. And we're going to expand upon what we previously did on the right hand side by moving these clouds up, trying to ensure that they are semi-transparent, leaving openings in the sky, but very slight ones, you know, creating these soft edges. There's a lot we can do. And I'm also working it back into the other previously applied smaller clouds. That way they're nice and cohesive because our colors will probably be a little bit different. There's nothing wrong with that but I want to ensure that it all feels natural. Now, if this new pigment is a little bit brighter, and hopefully it is, that's what we're aiming for, you're going to want to apply this to the bottom of your previously applied purple clouds. That way it looks like they have a little bit of extra light. It'll incorporate some additional depth. It's the same idea, the same rule as what we were doing with the orangey yellow and almost white clouds. So, you know, brighter colors on the bottom, a little bit sharper, on the top, it gets darker, it gets more semi-transparent. I know I've said that a hundred times already in this lesson, but I do think being a little repetitive is important to a point. That way, all of these ideas are retained and you can take them with you into future painting lessons and it's not just something you learn how to do here and then you forget. I want you to be able to not only create this painting, but understand how we're doing it and how you can take those ideas with you into the future and into your own works. So with that, I am now going to start working up over into the left-hand corner, and we are following all of those same rules. However, this time things are different. The base layer is entirely dry. We initially painted our purple into the sky with wet into wet, right? The blue was wet. Now it's not. We're painting wet into dry. So when I apply all of this paint, I have these harder edges for the most part because I'm not getting a soft blend. But as I start to run out of paint, as you can see, I'm working my brush in a bit of a circular motion on the canvas, and that's going to soften those edges. But you don't want to do that until your paint started to dry a little bit on the canvas and until you don't have much paint left on your brush. It's one of those things where you do want to time fairly well and it's a great way of softening a lot of them very, very quickly. However, you're also more than welcome to paint a couple of them, give them a second to dry a little bit, then go back and just focus on the edges very individually. I, however, didn't want to do that. I wanted to save a little bit of time, but I also wanted it to look a little patchy, which I know might sound strange, but the clouds in the reference photo are open to a point, however, never truly fully open. So I wanted to give it this really interesting look that you couldn't really see the sky, but you kind of can. It's much more ambiguous. Then I take more of our blue that we had from the sky and I work that back into our purple. So you can go back and you can refill in those open areas of sky, then blend those into the wet purple. So yet again, you're working wet into wet rather than wet into dry. There are a number of ways of going about this. And I just know that this will probably be the most tricky spot in the painting for the majority of you. So I wanted to give you a couple of options. First option, again, you go in with that purple, wet and dry, your brush is damp. And then once the majority of it is dry and you don't have much paint on your brush, you work with that circular effect to blend all of it at once. 
Then second option is you go in with the purple and you leave openings, you wait for it to dry a little bit, then you go and you just blend the edge with a bit of a circular motion on those and you do it a bit more slowly. The third option, you do either of the other two and then you go back in with the sky as I am right now, which will allow you to soften areas. Though here you can see that I'm working that circular motion with the blue on top of all of our purple clouds to make them a little bit more subtle which is also an interesting technique if you feel like they're just a bit too bold, a bit too purple. If they're taking away from the base of the painting, it's an additional thing you can try out and have fun with. That said, this is the sky. As you can see, I am doing a lot of layers. I think this is my third or fourth layer over the majority of it. So that's definitely something I'd recommend to you. It's not something that comes with the first application. It requires a couple of them. And as you do that, you get a little bit better. You learn every time. Here I am learning that my purple was a bit too stark, so I'm going in with more blues and I'm softening and I'm you know, using my finger to do some of that softening. I'm reworking some of the movements in the clouds, but I'm trying to make the purple as subtle as I can so that the movements aren't really noticeable. There isn't a lot of line work in them. It's very ambiguous and that's very much intentional. So that's what I'd personally recommend. Though, again, go into this recognizing it'll be tricky but it's okay, you can work through it. Just try all of these different techniques, figure out which ones work best for you, or if you'd like, keep the more open sky as well. That's an option. Now, the next step is something that some of us are going to have to do, not all of us, but I am some of us, and that is brighten the base of our sky just a little bit. Now, I'm going to work on creating a fairly bright gray here. We're using a lot of titanium white, hint of Mars black, hint of our ultramarine blue, and I'm going to be placing this above our purple clouds that are more so towards the middle of the painting. I want the sky to be a gradient. I want it to get darker as it moves upwards because it's moving farther away from the light, right? Visually, the, the light is emanating from the bottom of the painting. So the farther up we get, it makes sense that it gets darker. I tried to do this briefly, quickly, when I initially painted the blue of the sky, but I didn't get as dramatic of an effect as I wanted. And so we're going to go back and do that now. I would like to note that this first application, this first attempt that I'm making right here is more blue than it should be. Realistically, this color is eventually going to turn into that golden yellow that we have at the bottom, and therefore it should be moving farther away from a blue, not closer to it. So if you are going back and doing this, I'd recommend using more Mars black and more titanium white than blue than I did. It is something I go and correct, and I wanted to incorporate this part of the painting in here despite the fact that I didn't initially go in with the best color, because I think it's important to show that we all make mistakes and that we can fix all of them. So again, don't ever worry about that. I know skies can be tricky for people, but here I'm going in with that blue. I'm softening it down into the purple. That's why I'm using the Filbert brush. It does allow me to do all of that really nice soft blending. And I'm also working it in between some of the clouds and areas that I feel like could have openings. So it's going to give us some extra depth, extra dimension, though I wouldn't do too much kind of into the large blue blockier areas of the orange and yellow. Again, we are going to have openings, but we're not going to have that many openings. Now, I blend this down on top of quite a bit of the purple just to make it look nice and natural, but you can always go back and add more of that purple and then rework it upwards, which is definitely something I end up doing. But I also now need to blend some of our clouds that we have down into the blue. And this is quite the process for me. It definitely takes time. Again, I did the sky probably three or four times up with those purple clouds. And now yet again, I'm reincorporating them, remixing those purples, which again, isn't something to get frustrated with. When you're painting, it's great to recognize that the more you have to do something, the more you have to go back to something, the more you have to fix something, the more you give yourself an opportunity to, to familiarize yourself with different paints and colors. And that way, again, you retain them for the future. 
So here I'm taking that same technique, I'm bringing it back down into the newly brightened sky, and I think that for the most part things are starting to look better on that side, though we will go back and continue to edit. With the left hand area, I am now making it a bit more purple, I'm making it a bit more gray, we are moving away from the blue that I initially applied, and we are just making this very gradual transition. In a lot of skies that have very dramatic clouds like this, often you see the bottom area to be this bright glowing area, warm, then you see the cloud, and then above it you see something that's kind of a grayish blue that moves into a real blue. And it's kind of funny when you start to look at sunsets because it's actually very common. And it's a little counterintuitive because you say, well, why, why is half the sky yellow and gold and why is the other half blue, it's because there is a gradient occurring. There's more of a grayish pink that occurs in between the two pigments. And we don't see that transition because we have these larger dramatic clouds. So it's something to consider. Here I'm also throwing back in some of our orange clouds, and you can use these to cover up areas that you don't particularly love. So there are definitely ways of getting around areas that might just be a little too tricky. You don't want to deal with them. Recognize that that is 100% an option. And I also have a little bit of that golden orange now blending up into the bottom of that grayish blue, as you can see. And I did that very purposefully so that, again, we could just get a bit more of a natural transition. I think that things look a lot more soft because of it and I have no issue with that because while it is a very dramatic sky we do have a foreground we do have other subjects to kind of attract the viewer's eye and attention so it's something to consider but we're getting to the point where I am starting to like the sky quite a bit which is good because I'm looking at the timeline in the video we're at about 40 minutes I think I was probably at around the two hour mark real time and you know it, it's nice when it does start to come together after all of that time but here i'm going back in and i'm kind of re-solidifying some of the more prominent orange clouds because when we apply all of that backing all of that blue the gray the purple we can kind of go over the orange clouds that we previously created and we need to ensure that they are you know the more prominent pigment that they look like they are on top of the purple and the blue because in real life they are right they are the lower cloud they are overlapping the others and it's important that we visually articulate that so when i go back and kind of deal with all of this again i am being very mindful though it's worth noting that Again, this entire process only occurred because I feel like in my initial layer, I didn't create enough of a gradient between the uh, more so grayish blue, bright grayish blue at the bottom and then it moving up into a darker blue. So do try to keep that in mind. This all very well could be avoided. But for those of you who do not, like myself, <laughs> there are definitely ways of getting around it. Now, I would also like to note that the majority of the rest of the lesson will be done with me actually talking in real time while I'm painting, not doing a voiceover, but I wanted to do the intro of this painting in this manner because clouds can be a little tricky. I wanted to be able to really focus on the process rather than talking while doing so, but for the rest of it, you'll have me in real time. So I hope you like that, and it was a pleasure just doing this little voiceover. Uh, very soon we will jump back into the... Um, you know, regular way of going about it. So here, just doing a little bit of softening with that filbert and on to the next step. So now we're going to take our half inch flat headed brush, grab some of that Mars black, and at this point, everything's just about dry, so we can really place it wherever we'd like. We'll grab a hint of titanium white, not much because we don't want a pure Mars black, but we do want it to be a dark, fairly silhouetted pigment. So we'll mix that up right there. We'll test it on our reference photo. That looks quite good. However, what you can actually do with this and really all silhouettes, you can add extra color to them to make them warmer or cooler. So I'm going to add just a hint of red into this mix. It's going to be incredibly subtle, probably to the point where you don't really even recognize it. 
and I'll use that for this middle area, and I might make the edges a little bit more blue. Howie apparently agrees. So now we're going to take some of that pigment and start working on this tree line in the background. I'm going to begin by crafting a fairly sharp line towards the bottom here. And I generally like to work on my sharpest applications first because again, that's when you have the easiest time because you have the most control over your pigment. As you start to run out, we have to press harder with our brush, we have less option, and so it's better to just work on those sharper applications first. Now, I'm working upwards, as you can tell, all of these vertical strokes, but I'm using the body of the brush, and the idea is that all of the little bristles are occasionally lifting up higher to varying degrees and creating the implication of distant trees, some of which just working up higher than others. It's a very quick and easy way of getting this done and getting incredibly small markings because when you have individual bristles rising up and doing this, you're getting really the smallest application you possibly can. With that, I'm going to go back to my palette because this line of paint has essentially started to dry and we do need more. You can also start to press a little bit harder with your brush when you're at the bottom area and then relieve pressure as you get towards the top. Going to make my brush a little bit more damp. We'll probably mix up more paint at this point as well because it is starting to dry on the palette. I get a lot of questions about how I keep my paint wet on the palette and the answer is I generally don't. It dries just like it does for everyone else and I remix. But that really isn't a bad thing. Having to remix really teaches you to know your colors and your mixing. Gives you more practice. And again, it's not something I would get frustrated with. It's kind of something I'd you know, try to find the silver lining in. With that, as we get towards this edge here, the silhouette of trees get closer to us, and therefore, because of perspective, they get taller. So I'm just going to raise that a little bit. There we go. Clean up the edge. And happens over here as well. So I'm just going to mark this in. You can see that now I'm holding the brush on its side, so I don't get the entire body of it but you can get these actually protruding trees. With that, we can switch to a smaller brush as well and get far more detail. So, let's do just that. So, now we're switching over to a smaller liner brush and we'll use this for the real details on the distant trees. So, here we are, a little bit farther back. That way you can get a good perspective of how large these actually are in relation to everything else. And I want to show you that the ones that I'm doing down here are going to be smaller than the ones that we do at the top because this is supposedly supposed to be a little bit closer to us. And again, the closer we get, the larger our subjects will be. So we'll just have them get slightly smaller as we move down in that area. We can also go in and tap in little details if you want. Little branches that are extending outwards. You can have fun with the type of tree that you have here as well. There we go. You can make it more eclectic if you want, or you can make it similar type of tree. So it feels cohesive. It's up to you. There we are. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to the left hand side. I'm not going to do too many over here, but we'll do a couple. We'll have two or three trees that are quite a bit larger, right here. And I selected them simply because I saw them on the reference photo, but they do balance the piece quite well. I want to ensure that both sides have some raised taller trees, 
but I want the way they're placed, their positioning, their orientation to be different so that they are captivating, right? And these being slightly more so closer to the middle definitely helps with that. The fact that there's a smaller number of them also aids us in that. And you can see that I'm just slightly moving off to the edges, creating some detail work. I wanted to do this part very specifically from a bit of a distance because it's easy to overdo it and it's something that you generally want to do a little bit farther away. That way you make sure that you're not overdoing it and that everything still works together well. So while it's a detailed thing, if you can, try to extend your arm a little bit and paint this so that you can see the entirety of the painting as you go ahead and do it. Really like that. Maybe add another little tree right here, one beside it. There we go. And then you can just throw small little tops of them in here. I'm going down with my stroke. Remember, it is ideal to do the upward vertical motion, but with that, I'm fairly happy, and I think we can move on to the next step. So now we're going to take the one inch flat headed brush and we're going to mix up the pigment for the darker areas of snow that we have here that we have in the background. And this is going to act as the base layer which will apply all of the highlights too. So we're going to start with some of our ultramarine blue. The black has dried at this point so I'm just going to mix on top of that area. We'll grab about an equal mixture of our deep violet. We'll grab a good amount of titanium white, hint of Mars black to desaturate it a little bit. And I did pre-mix the color just to make sure that it was correct. And that is right there. So we can test this, what we just came up with. And I can tell that already it's a little bit too dark. We'll grab some extra titanium white, mix that in. And we'll give that a test. And I think that looks far better. It's slightly more pigmented, but I actually like it a lot. And I think this will act as a great base layer. So let's throw that on over the canvas. So now we get to have quite a bit of fun and we're going to start by yet again, working on our horizon line first, as it is easiest when we have a good amount of paint on our brush, when our brush is still fairly damp. I'm not creating a single line all the way across. I'm creating a series of them. And I'm doing that so that I get a much more consistent application. Often when you move your hand all the way through a larger motion, you end up having a larger curve. I didn't want that. I wanted a bit more control and I also don't mind the slight little humps that you find in there because it really does give it a bit of volume and it makes the ground look less flat, which again, great for just making it look more natural. Once that's done, I'm going to fill in the background and I'm applying a bit of pressure here with my brush just to get the paint off of it. But once that's done, I'm going to move back over it with a bit more control and ensure that we don't have a myriad of brush strokes. Often, when you apply more pressure with your brush to get paint off, you end up creating a lot of brush strokes which are fairly noticeable and the best way to alleviate those again is just to go over it softly a couple of times back and forth. There we go. And I think this is already quite interesting because often a lot of people think of snow as you know being this almost bright titanium white pigment but realistically when there isn't much light, when there's all of this blue and purple light reflecting, you're going to end up with something a bit more interesting. And we will build highlights on top of this. We will, you know, consider the colors in the sky and how they're going to work their way down here. But for a base layer, this will work quite well. 
And I actually think that this is going to end right about here. So we don't have to worry about that area. That said, I also want to work on the snow over on this side of our little road. And as you can see, my brush is already running out of pigment. So make sure it's nice and damp. Grab more paint. Redefine those lines. There we go, that's nice and sharp. Fix that edge. There we go. And then it kind of builds up into a larger mound, which then extends here. So I'm just going to go over the entirety of my drawing, not too worried about it. Fairly easy to redraw back in. You can, if you kind of lose its pacing, just go back to the start of the video. Or if you are up over on Patreon, you can just use the traceable or the reference photo. But with that, I'm going to mix up some additional paint, fill that in, and then we will chat for the next step. It's also worth noting that as we get farther away from the light, we can make things a little bit darker and a little bit more blue. So I'm actually going to work some additional blue into there, some additional Mars black. We're not going to make it dramatically different, but we'll make it a little bit different. Now that we have our darker base layer applied, we're going to switch to our filbert brush. Again, this one is about a third of an inch, and we're going to start creating the highlight that we see right on top of the snow. Now, I'm going to begin by taking quite a bit of a titanium white, and I'm going to mix it over here because that's still a little bit wet, and we don't want them mixing. Now, I'm going to say, okay, what color is that? It's a little bit pink, it's a little bit orange. Both of those use a red, so you know what, we'll grab some of our cadmium red medium hue. And we'll just try, very simply, see what that looks like. Definitely looks too bright, so we say, okay, you know what, let's add a little bit more red. That will darken it. We'll also add a small hint of Mars Black, not much at all. I wipe off the excess as we generally do, and we can test this right here. Now it's starting to look a little bit too dark, but I like where it's going. I like that it's less saturated. So we'll add more titanium white, test that, and now it's too desaturated because the white and the black desaturated it together. We'll throw in more red. That's looking really nice. I feel like it could be a little bit more purple though. So we'll grab some of our deep violet. And I like that a lot. As you can probably tell, it is more pink, more purple than what we have here, but I want to do a third layer with more of an orange. And I want to build our base here with the pink because we don't necessarily want the yellow in an orange to mix with what we had here as it may render a little bit more of a green. So we're going to be extra safe by doing our next layer with more of a pink and then we'll do some orange after that. Hope that makes sense. So now we're going to take that new pigment and initially this is going to look quite stark. So brace yourself for that. It is okay. I am going to find myself in the middle-ish area of our landscape, and I'm going to start kind of chartering the line where we're going to have some of the bushes that were initially drawn in there, and of course, for the most part, covered in snow. But I like to start in the middle, because that's where the majority of the light is going to come out, and then it'll dissipate as you move towards the sides. I'm using the filbert brush, because I want a little bit of a brush stroke in here, and this is going to give us a nice, relatively soft one. So you can see that I'm moving out to the sides. At right about here, we're going to have that section of bushes end, so you know it'll start to move up. 
we'll move kind of charter the top of that area. And this will essentially be the back of a snowbank where those bushes are, and therefore it's darker because it's on the opposite side of the light. Then we'll start to move up a little bit. Our paint is starting to dissipate. You can see that it's getting a bit chalky here on the canvas. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to draw a little bit of a line so we know where this snowbank ends. I'm going to make my brush slightly more damp. We'll grab a little bit more paint. Then we'll come back into the middle, work our way up, work our way to the left. We'll slowly allow that paint to dissipate and therefore that light to dissipate. It's going to give us some dimension in our landscape. We're going to blend into the line that we just drew as well. That way we don't have any hard lines or edges separating our snow. And then I'm going to soften, now that I have almost no pigment left on this brush, this top line. And at this point I'm kind of pressing the brush into the canvas, something I generally avoid against because you can kind of rip off too much paint to the point where you don't have enough coverage and the canvas shows through, but we do have a nice thick base layer and it's okay. With that, I'm gonna get you a little bit closer. So here, hopefully it's evident that this is fairly transparent and that is just, you know, what happens with our first layer of acrylic generally. So we can go back over it with some additional paint Thicken that up so that again, we have a good amount in the center and then less so as you move towards both sides. We'll also start blending off to the side here. We'll continue to creep that slightly sharp edge for that snow mound. But as we move down, things are about to change a little bit. And we're going to hold the brush so that the bristles are essentially horizontal and we'll move in towards the road here with those strokes. We'll connect them to the larger body of snow that we have here, but we'll leave little openings much like that. I'm going to make my brush a little bit more damp, grab additional paint. And the idea here is that we have all of these little mounds and while areas stick up and catch light, like what you're seeing right now, there are areas that are, again, opposite to the light. They're facing in the opposite direction and they just don't get that nice pink that all of this does. So, I'm just leading a couple of those strokes in and generally they draft downwards at slightly different angles, slightly different trajectories. You have some that are a bit longer than others. And quite interesting, right here, it's slightly too wet to apply paint to. So the more I try to apply paint right here, the more it'll rip off paint. This happens when we do wet our brush quite a lot and we don't take off enough with paper towel or painting cloth. So what I'm going to do to remedy that is just let it dry. I'm not going to touch it until it's dry. And then once it is, there'll be no issues painting over it. So just a general little tip there. Now I'm going to finish off this top area. I don't have much pigment left on my brush. So creating these not hard strokes is quite easy. There we go. Again, it looks pretty rough right now, but that is okay. It's meant to at this point. And once we get the oranges and the warmer pigments in there, it'll look a whole lot better. Acrylic painting is very much about patience, building up those layers. And I think that's a really, really great thing. It's also incredibly forgiving, right? If we don't like something, just let it dry for five, six minutes, come back in, reapply that paint, do it all over again. With, of course, the lessons that you learned and the information of what you don't necessarily like. So, yeah. Anyways, with that, I think that layer is looking fairly good for now, with the exception of that. I'll let it all dry, I'll fix that up, and we'll switch into our next step. 
On second thought, I was going to proceed and do the rest of this myself, but I thought, you know what, we could also do this side at the same time. We're using the same pigments, really. So here, at the forefront of the base of this mound of snow, we're going to apply some of our pigment, and then as we work backwards, we'll allow there to be these smaller, darker openings where, again, that is essentially a more shadowy area. And we can move up bit by bit. This area, of course, is going to get quite a bit of light, as is the top. However, we also want there to be little mounds of snow at the top. So I'm going to start creating these little divots, as you can see. And they don't all have to connect. Here we can do one that's a bit farther out. And I am, <laughs> I know we're quite far away from the actual canvas right now. The day again is purse uh, that, that is being done purposefully because it's so easy to get wrapped up in the details here and kind of lose sight of how much you actually want, what the painting actually looks like. So again, this is another little section that I'd recommend trying to do at least initially from a bit of a distance, then when you want to fine tune things, then you move in closer, but you do regularly take those steps back. I feel like this is something I mention every lesson, but it's just so pivotal, and I think that it really does help a lot of people. So with that, quite happy with that area, quite happy with this area, we'll just Build that up slightly more. And now we can go back into the background there. I'm going to just add slightly more titanium white. We'll add that to the middle. We'll start blending off to the sides. You can already see what a massive difference just having that second layer is doing. I think it looks a lot better. And we're going to do a lot more than just two layers here because we do want that orange. We want that nice warmth added in. Here I'll start working back into those little protruding areas of snow which do catch additional light. There we go. Looks quite nice. Okay. So, now that this is applied, we can go back and do a second layer on that. Again, a little bit brighter this time. Just add a hint of titanium white. We're building it up. Starting on that edge. And it should be dry. If it's not, I'd recommend just giving it slightly more time and then you can jump back into it. Now that this is a bit more highlighted it differentiates itself from that area quite well. There we go. Do that. We have some good volumes happening here. And then if you want you can softly move over some of these darker areas. Watch this. So it's lightening them slightly, but not so much to the point where you no longer see the contrast and the general movements. This is something I like to do in the areas that I feel might get a little bit of reflected light, but not too much, or areas that don't deserve as much contrast. So this is a little bit farther away. So I might do that over these, and then I do less and less as I get closer to us, that way we have more contrast. Generally, there's more contrast in the foreground as is. Yeah. And if you accidentally take out too many of those darker areas, we can always go back in and work them into the painting. So no worries there either. With that, I think that section looks quite good. And I think we are ready to move on. So once that pink backdrop has fully dried, we're going to take some of our cadmium yellow deep hue, 
we'll just apply that over our previous mix. If it mixes with that last color, that is okay. We'll grab some of our red, grab some of our titanium white. This time we are going to avoid the Mars black because the Mars black and the yellow will turn into a green. I think that looks really nice. Let's give it a test. Oh, that is wonderful. Okay, it could be a little bit brighter though, admittedly. So we will grab some extra titanium white. And I think that's pretty perfect. So let's head back over onto the canvas. So I've gone ahead and mixed quite a bit of that pigment as I knew I did really like it. And we're going to start predominantly here in the middle, just like we did previously where we feel the majority of that light will be coming down. We'll work that along this edge right here. And then we'll hope that our paint starts to run out a little bit. So that we can start to blend it out, but do so in a fairly subtle way that allows it to be semi-transparent and lets the more pink layer underneath show through to a point. So that's what we're doing. It is running out. I'm trying to leave little openings in the same way we did with that, with the pink, so that there are these additional little mounds of softer shadows, essentially. We're going to wet our brush right now. We're going to go back in with just the damp brush and move out the paint that we already have on the canvas. You can see that we can pick it up as we go. And now we'll start moving it into the background. I am going to leave a slight line of more pinkish blue right here. And I'm doing that very specifically because these are going to cast a little bit of a shadow in the foreground. And that is going to be that cooler, darker value. We'll bring this over to the left, but of course, keep it softer. Barely applying any pressure right now. Just letting what little watery pigment on my brush move out. I think that looks quite nice. Go back, grab some more. We can apply this to the tops of a lot of these mounds. Further define these areas. And then we have it, you know, kind of get lost into the background, just blend out, get softer. If you accidentally apply too much of this orangey pigment, you can always go back and add more of the pink. So again, don't worry too much about it. Give it a good try, figure out how much you like, and work it back if you need to. That's generally how I like to complete my paintings, actually. I do as much as I possibly can until the point where I've done slightly more than I'd like, and then I walk it back. That way, I know very definitively how much I want in the painting. I know what too little looks like. I know what too much looks like. It means that you have to do some extra work. It means that you have to remix some previously applied colors. But that's generally great because it really ensures that you know what you did and that you can take these ideas into future lessons. And that's something I very strongly believe. And again, that's my general way of going about finishing paintings and subjects in general. There we go. Now we do need to go back and work on this, but we'll do that in a second. And I definitely want more detail down here. But for now, I think that's looking quite good. So for our next step, it is imperative that we ensure that our brushes and our water are clean because we are going to go back to our blue. But right now we're going to mix up some of the highlights that we have in the shadowy areas of the snow. And it's important to recognize that not all shadows have the same values or look the same. Here we have a darker shadow, which we mixed before. Now we're going to go for the lighter area. So I'm going to start with some of our titanium white. I'm going to grab 
some of our ultramarine blue, probably about double that in titanium white to ultramarine blue. We'll grab a hint of Mars black, and I do mean just a hint because it is just such a dominant pigment. And now we'll test that right over here. Already, I can see that we're quite close. I like that. It does need to be slightly more desaturated. And I think I'm going to add a hint of purple into ours because our base layer of snow was relatively purple and I just wanted to feel a bit more cohesive. So we'll test that. I think that looks wonderful. So let's head on over to the canvas, mix up quite a bit more and start applying it. So now it's important to remember that this is a mound of snow, that there's essentially a wall built up right here, and that is essentially on the opposite side of the light. However, there is this bottom ledge area and this top ledge area which are going to have more light, and that's predominantly where we're going to be adding this slight highlight. So I'm going to start by just testing it with our previous applications, make sure that, you know what? It looks quite good. We'll throw it behind them so that it looks like it's a bit of a shadow. And you know what? I think it looks just a little bit too bright to kind of be the secondary pigment to that. So while it matched our reference photo, I think I am going to make it slightly darker. Just add in some Mars black. Not a dramatic change. We'll go back in and already I think that's significantly better. So. Now, this is our brighter shadow color. I'm going to have it predominantly along the edge here, and I'm going to leave this darker edge at the bottom as it again is another shelf like this, which should remain a bit darker. And I'm going to do a bit of a zigzag effect down here, I'm going to create these little movements in and out, just allow it to be a bit more captivating. And then, we have it move up, we'll have this move up, we'll have this get larger as we move towards us because perspective is making it look smaller over there. So we'll expand like so. And you can make this look a little bit darker if you want, you can add some Additional Mars black as you get closer to us as we're moving farther away from the light, but it isn't it isn't actually necessary Though we will now still continue to move up here You can tell that I'm really starting to run out of pigment on my brush and that is ideal That is what we want. It's going to allow us to craft these softer blends and so now we'll go back down to the harder edges that we previously had Soften those up. Here I'll go, I'll do a second layer. Every time you do another layer, you will brighten it a little bit because this pigment is brighter than our base layer. And our thin layers are of course a combination of what we have on our palette, what we have on our brush, and whatever the under color is of our base layer because it's showing through on that first layer. Acrylics are semi-transparent and that does have a big impact. So now, do a little bit of a blend here. I'm not going to do too many layers in here so that it remains slightly darker. Howie agrees. <laughs> Howie's uh, pretty vocal today. But we are going to head back up there. I like that. We can add some of this shadow in between portions of the pink as well. We'll bring that back down, bring it back up. I'm not going to copy the reference photo exactly in this area, just because I have my own vision for the movements and you're more than welcome to take those artistic liberties, make the paintings your own, have fun with it. The reference photos, as I always say, are there to help you to give you assistance, to show you how to elaborate on subjects, that way they don't look cartoony, but at the same time you don't want them to kind of lock you into ideas. Recognize that you can take those artistic liberties, you can make it your own, and that is a-okay. Makes for interesting pieces. 
up over on the Facebook group that I have for all the patrons at the uh, one of the um, middle tiers. Um, I get to see all of these different renditions of our pieces and I, I love to see when people kind of explore, make them their own, really play with it. And again, that only happens when we do deviate a little bit. So, if you have the reference photos, use it to, you know, ensure that your painting is looking right, but don't feel like you have to copy it exactly. I certainly don't. With that, we're going to use this more watery application here for the back because I do want it to be a bit darker. There we go. We're almost at that top platform. We don't need too much of a movement through this area. In fact, there's supposed to be a darker little divot in the snow right here, which we can make fairly simply. We'll just grab some Mars Black, work that into our current mixture. This will be darker than anything we have. Create a sharp line. Oh, and it isn't. It isn't darker than our initial snowy base layer. So you know what? Let's make it even darker, but let's add in some color so that it's still relatively saturated. Right now we're essentially just mixing Mars Black into this fairly gray pigment, so we just add in the extra blue and purple to make it a bit more interesting. Give it a sharp bottom line there. There we go. This is an element from the reference photo that I liked. I felt that we should keep. It's just something that I wouldn't inherently think to put in myself but it does make it look a bit more natural, more interesting. So, I like that. Okay, we can do another one over here. There we go. All right, so all of that so far looks great, but what I also want to do while we're here working with these blues is head back up into that and define the top area of that snowy bank. Now what we're going to do doesn't require too much work. We do need the color that we initially had for the most part, so we get to have some fun remixing. Again, I think that's such a good thing to get in the habit of. Really helps you learn your colors and keep that information with you for the future. Which is something I think really should be focused on in these lessons. The idea that you know, we don't just mix a color once, we learn how to mix it. That way we can do so in the future as much as we want. Let's test this. Looks a little bit too dark, a little bit too saturated. How do we fix that? Let's say, okay, you know, let's uh, add some titanium white. That will both lighten it and desaturate it. Let's go ahead, give that a test, and there it is. Great. So now I'm just creating a sharper top for this area. And I'm also going to create some little areas that stick out, that protrude, like that. And these are essentially following little pieces of our bush upwards, right? These are small mounds that are collecting at the bottom of our eventual bushes. Lots of little twigs, right? So, there we go. With that, I think we'll take a couple of steps back, look at our painting, and make sure that we're on the right track. So, for our next step, we're going to take our damp half-inch flat-headed brush, and we're going to create the base layer for this area right here. It's not the actual ice or the reflective surface, but rather more frozen ground. So, we're going to start with some of our Mars Black. We'll grab a little bit of Burnt Umber. We'll grab the smallest tint of our Titanium White. And for some color, I think we'll go with just a, just a hint of our Deep Violet. So this should be quite dark, and I think that'll work fairly well. So now we're going to grab quite a bit of that pigment, and I'm going to start working in the background area, simply because when we have new paint on our brush, we do have more control, and this background area is smaller, so it requires more control. 
We'll start working that over to the right hand side of the canvas. As I get over here, I'll start to apply slightly more pressure with my brush, which will expand our bristles and give us a larger application so that we don't have to go over this area too many times. It's just going to make the process a little bit easier. You can see that I'm kind of bobbing and weaving back and forth out to this side and in here. We'll have some protruding areas like what you can see and then we'll just bring it down to the bottom. Fill in the larger negative space and now we need to move it back into the snow. I'm going to be fairly careful here. We're going to pick very selected areas. Generally, where you see the highlight, you want to work just above that, so it's essentially at the bottom of the purple and the areas of shadow. That said, I'm definitely going to go back and add in more snow here and play with this just because I feel like it looks a little too visually repetitive. But this is a good general rule. So we're just finding the bottom of the snow, which again is the bottom of the purple, the top of the highlight, and we just do that. Now we should do a couple of layers. Make sure that it's nice and thick. We are working with a <laughs> very dark and at this point, pretty reflective color. So if it looks slightly too bright for you, don't worry about it. On your piece, let it dry first, and then if you feel like it's too bright, go in with a slightly darker mixture, but you don't need to do that from the start. In fact, I'd advise against it. Now we're just doing a little bit over here, starting to run out of water in my brush. So, I'm getting a bit more of a chalky look, getting that canvas showing through, so I just wet my brush and grabbed more paint, and I do that even if I still have paint on my brush, because having it damp when you want to create these clean, sharp lines, it's important. I'd also like to note here that this is also getting wider as you move down towards this edge, simply because of perspective. Grab some more water, grab more paint, and now we can start working on some of these areas that kind of move out more so towards the middle of this lane right here. Just looking on the reference photo. I have it slightly sketched out, but I know that I want to make minor alterations. There we go. And there's a larger piece right here. There we are. So we'll essentially have all of our reflective surface in the white of the canvas. Though this will be a little bit reflective because while it's the ground, it's frosty and it'll definitely bounce quite a bit of light off. In the background here, it's looking a little dark by the way. So I'm going to grab minor amount of titanium white work that into our mixture and I'm just going to soften the value in the distance here that way it doesn't steal our attention to a great extent and the eye can naturally continue to move into that foreground where the real contrast is we just don't want it competing too too much because it doesn't have to and it doesn't really serve the painting sometimes more contrast isn't the best thing and generally you want more contrast as you move towards the foreground because you have less atmospheric reflective light. There we go. Just covering that up and we wanted to do multiple layers anyway so this was a process that was going to have to occur. There we are. Okay. I'm going to let that dry, I'm going to do a second layer, and then we'll go in with the next application, which will be more of the highlights on top of the edge. But we do need to wait for it to dry first. Uh -huh. 
Now we're going to switch back to our fill work brush and start working on some of the highlights right on top there. So we'll begin with some titanium white and I'm going to start right beside the mixture that we used for the base layer. That way I can see how it'll kind of compare and contrast. Then I say, you know what, that looks like a warm color. So we'll try just a little bit of red, but this is definitely more pink than that. So we say, okay, you know what, let's make it more orange, I suppose. So we add in some yellow. I think that looks far too yellow. That does, you know, kind of skew towards red. So we go back to more red and we'll give this a try. I think that the color itself is quite close, but I do think it's a little bit too bright and a little bit too saturated. So we say, okay, let's darken it. Let's desaturate it. Mars Black will do both of those. Mix that up and we can use the Mars Black despite the fact that we used the yellow because we used more red and the red is essentially going to save us in that scenario. And this right here looks great. It isn't the absolute brightest color that we have in here, but it's the average value and hue that we have for the highlights. So once we apply this, we can go back with slightly brighter highlights, slightly more saturated applications and get some real detail in there. But for the second layer, this is great. So now we're going to jump back in there. And when I go to apply this, I'm going to look at these different movements. So all of these little bumps here, and I'm going to imagine that each of them is its own little piece that fits in and around others. So we'll start by adding some of this highlight to the top there. And immediately, you know what, I'm going to test it up here. Well, again, I think it worked well in our reference photo. I think it's a little bit too bright for our actual painting. So I'm going to grab some additional Mars Black. We're going to desaturate it. We're going to darken it. I'll try in a different area. Yeah, that's a lot better. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the top of where I see the protruding area. I'm going to apply the paint over that. I'm going to leave a slight dark lip right underneath and then I'll go again back to the top of this. I'll get you a little bit closer. Now, admittedly, I don't have the best angle here for painting and seeing because of the camera. So if I do kind of move in front of it, I do apologize. I am going to try to watch out for that, but recognize that this is kind of an imperfect scenario. That said, once I have that edge, I kind of start to move inwards and I do so with more of a tap leaving all of these dark little openings that you can see in there. And this will be fantastic for detail. Now I mentioned separating different protruding areas. So we have that one installed. Let's do this one now. So I'll start by creating a more definitive top line. So there's a break between these two. And then I'll go in yet again with that tapping motion, just like that. Looks like all of these little mounds of dirt that are raised up very slightly. Now we have those two separated, so let's move on to the third. Again, bit of a harder line, bit of a tap leaving openings. There we go. That actually, actually looks really good. I like that a lot. Okay, I'm going to dampen my brush because I can tell I'm almost out of water and I do need fairly clean, sharp applications here. So again, regardless of if we have paint on our brush, we probably want to do that. Now I'm going to move back here and avoid that area because I want that to dry. Otherwise, if I painted on top of it right now, it would just mix with our current color and we'd have something brighter and something that just doesn't fit with the rest of our painting. So it's okay to try different colors, but when they don't end up working, let them dry and then cover them up. Don't, don't fight it too much, especially if you find the correct color relatively quickly, like we did here. Just going to grab a little bit more water, more paint. As you move into the background, we can go in with slightly more water so that we have slightly more transparent applications. And we might press a little bit harder with our brush as well as make our applications closer together. That way we don't have all of this separation, all of this detail, because you just don't see that detail that far away. So we're looking for the same idea and really the implication of what we were achieving here in the foreground. 
And as I get towards the background here, I'm even dragging my brush. I'm not even doing just a tap. I'm doing a tap and drag. That way it softens my application. Often if you want something very sharp, you go in with just a pure tap, like what we did here. You can see all of those discernible little factors. But in the background, it's as soft as it is because I'm doing a tap and then I'm doing a drag. So recognize whenever you're applying very sharp details in a painting, often you're going to want to avoid any type of movement as soon as that brush hits the canvas. Here, I feel like this is more so the mid-ground. We can add that detail. I'm going to assume that this is dry. Seems to be. We need more actual paint. There we go. Okay, now we can add a little bit to this middle area right here. It's not too close, not too far. It's really going to be a combination of taps and drags. I do want the top to have a bit of light on it though, so we'll continue that forward. And if you make something too bright, don't worry, you can always make it darker again. Now this is something I'm going to do when I have not much paint on my brush because I want it to be fairly transparent, want it to be fairly dark. It's getting a lot of shadow, unlike this where it's actually getting light. So we'll just apply that like that, nice and simple. Now, we'll get a little bit farther away and add a minor highlight to it. It's also worth noting that for this next step, we will be working with our smaller liner brush as we do want some sharp details for the foreground. Now what we're going to do is make sure our brush is nice and wet, and we're going to mix up a brighter variant of this. Often I advise against not mixing with your liner brush because it's just so difficult to grab an abundance of paint. However, it's doable. And <laughs> while I advise different things in this lesson, I always like to remind people that you can do things different ways and that it's an artistic process. And I, I just like to show how you can also do these things if you'd like to, right? So here we now have a brighter variant. I think we need to desaturate it a little bit. So I'll add some titanium white, which will brighten it even further, but we can make it darker with just a hint of Mars black, not much because Again, this is meant to be a poppy color in relation to that, and I think that does so quite well. So, yet again, we'll grab more water. We'll head in here. Going to find the tops of some of these mounds of dirt here. And we'll just go in and we'll tap. And we are just tapping for the most part in the foreground. No real drag effect. Just adding a little bit of this warmer orange. And then as you move into the background, particularly this middle area, you can do a bit of a drag there. Going to get some additional water. And I'm doing this from a distance. I know I'm quite far away from the canvas, but this is another spot where I just feel like it's very easy to overdo it. So, Painting a little bit farther back is generally ideal. Personally, I'm using the viewfinder in my camera right now. So while I'm quite close to the canvas, I have a very far view of it. There we go. Again, lots of blending here in the background. I'm using the edge of the brush to do a lot of that blending. We will make that nice and wet. We'll grab some additional titanium white. This time we'll make it more pink. There we go. Come back in, further diversify. Taps in the foreground, following the larger highlights. Starting to look like it fits within the piece. The palette's definitely getting there, despite being more subdued, despite being darker. Trying to leave the lip 
right here of the snow where it meets the ground quite a bit darker but as I move away you can see that we're getting brighter I'm just trying to figure out where that light's coming from and how we can best visually articulate it show it in the painting right yet again make it slightly brighter add more red I really like the pink in this area specifically and remember it does still need to be darker than the highlight that we have in the snow so we're slowly building it up we're not getting too crazy There we are. Keeping that slightly dark edge. We're getting closer to the foreground, so I'm going back to a tap rather than the drag effect that I'm currently implementing in the background here. And I know this looks a little abstract right now, but it will look pretty natural relatively soon. There we go. Yeah, I have a lot of faith in this. I think this is going to look really wonderful when we complete it. Yet again, brighter, a little bit more red. And I think I'll just continue touching this up for another you know, 30 seconds here. Definitely want this middle area to be a bit brighter. And we haven't done too much to the foreground lately, so we'll just do a couple little applications. You can see that I'm doing a lot of very close taps together. That way they can form lines to a point. And therefore, prominent edging, which is catching light. And we'll just do a couple almost randomized taps just to give it some extra texture. There we go. Okay, and with that, on to the next step. So now we get to work on what I find to be a really fun part, and that is this very reflective, icy water-ish um, layer. It, it's definitely both. It, it's definitely ice that is in the process of melting, which makes it even more fun. But we're going to start by mixing this more so warmish gray that we have on the right hand side. We'll go with some titanium white, some Mars black. We know that it's fairly gray. And then we can, you know, visually discern that it's a bit warmer. So we can add some red. But we also know that a lot of the painting has some purple in it, so we'll, we'll throw a little bit of that in there too. Give that a test. I really like it for the edge. It's obviously not dark enough for the middle section. So I'm going to keep what we had off to the side so that we can use that for the edge. And then we'll mix a darker variant, as you can see, using the same colors, just a little bit more Mars Black for the middle. And that is far too dark. Okay, let's try this right here. That's looking quite nice. I think we need something in between our last two mixes. That looks great. Okay, so we're going to use that for the edges, we're going to use that for the middle section, and then we'll start applying other colors on top of it. So we're going to begin with our brighter pigment here, and we'll start working that along our edges of the ground, and you can reshape the ground with this if you'd like, you can kind of work on top of it, which is nice. A little bit later on we should probably go back and do a little bit more of the detail work with this, after this has been applied. That way we can get all of our highlights on it popping in the way we really want them to. 
But for now, we do have the opportunity to rework, and we'll do exactly that. So, I'm working this on the right hand side, as you can see. We'll move it back here, and this will eventually be a warmer yellowish orange, but the more layers the better. This is a good base, so we'll just move this back here. I'm doing a little bit more of a grind into the canvas than I'd like normally, but I think we're okay because we do intend to do so much layering here. Generally we avoid this because it leaves um, layers thin and therefore not that professional looking, but when we know that we're going to go back and we're going to do a lot of layering anyway, it is okay. Again, there are exceptions to all of these rules. There we go. And from here down essentially, we're really going to lose a lot of the light. So I'm going to soften the edge because it was fairly hard and difficult to blend with. We'll grab our darker pigment. We'll start applying that. We'll aim for a soft blend into the right hand side and top using very little pressure. We'll have to mix it more because it did start to dry on the palette while I was applying the other paint. So I'll mix that up right quick. Needs to be a little bit brighter. Left a little bit on the side so that I knew what I was mixing to. This ended up being slightly darker, but I really don't think that's an issue. So we will start by working on our edge, as we often do. Move it up and start blending it into the brighter applications. There we go. And now softly, we work into the rest. Alright, so, so far so good. Let's do a second layer with the brighter pigment, and that means mixing more paint yet again, because ours definitely dried. We can even grab some of that darker pigment to help us mix to it, and you can see that I'm keeping it right up there, the initial mixture, that way I know what I'm mixing to. A good point of reference, and we have a little bit of white paint dividing it. I think we go slightly darker. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So. Go back, find our edges, work our way out. I'm starting to lose this area in the center, that is okay. It's very easy to go back and paint in. We'll continue this highlight. And aim for a very subtle gradient between the lighter and the darker gray. And here I'm actually just going to start working on top of this. We kind of moved on its space a little bit too much to retain what we had anyway. Might as well just repaint it. Again, we're working with acrylics, quite easy to do. So we might as well make the job easier in blending here and just, just go on top. Going over it all a couple times. Moving in the general direction of the road itself. And that's a great start. But we definitely need our highlights, and that's the really fun part. So, now we're going to head back over to our reference photo, let that dry, start to do some additional mixing. For this next step, we're going to continue using our half-inch flat-headed brush, and we're going to start by grabbing quite a bit of titanium white. Now, you want to mix this in a relatively clean, or at least not wet portion, of your palette because anywhere right here will render you a very different color. We'll grab about an equal mixture 
of red, titanium white, and we'll mix up a nice bright color, relatively similar to the yellow that we had in the sky. So I think we'll need a bit more titanium white. I'll give that a test right here. And I think that works really well for this mid-level orange, but it isn't the yellow that we want. So, you know what, we'll keep this. We'll start a secondary amount over here. More titanium white, more yellow to kind of overpower the red that we had in. Definitely brighter, definitely more yellow dominant. And I like that a lot. That's a really nice color. Okay, so now we have those two, and I think that's enough to start. So, back to the canvas. So, we're going to begin by taking that brighter yellow that we have here. I'm going to go to the back of this area. And we'll just start applying that beautiful golden reflection. Trying to keep that dark lip that we've created as well. I no longer have enough water on my brush to continue moving sharply, so I'm just going to apply a little bit of pressure, get what paint I have on my brush off, because it's good paint, we need to cover this area, but I'm doing some more in the middle, because again, it's just not sharp enough to work around the edges in the way that I want. So we'll move that out to, say there, do a secondary layer, as some of it has started to dry. Make my brush nice and damp. Go back, grab more. Using my pinky finger to ground my hand. I'm using the sharp corner of the brush to guide my stroke and work along these very definitive edges. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, now we'll extend it a little bit farther and make it a relatively soft edge. Again, that's important for blending. It'll make it easier if this starts to dry. Now, make my brush nice and damp. We go back to the orange we created and there's just not enough of it. So relatively quickly, while the yellow is still wet, we will remix. I have my color off to the side here so I know what I'm working towards. I know that it's yellow dominant. I know that it has a lot of titanium white. Oh, we are so close. More titanium white. You know what? I really like that. That's what we'll go with. So, <laughs> we'll start to head into here. Looking at the reference photo, I can see that it moves around this bend. Goes to there. We have a nice soft transition back into the yellow. Which we will do another layer of, by the way. There we go. And this moves forward along with the road. Eventually dissipates around there. Bit of this highlight moves out to the right. You can see that it gets wider as we get towards that edge. And we also have some that moves along here and back. There we go. Going over it again to make sure that it's a bit more opaque. And now we can make a slightly more red variant just like that. I'm going to work that along these edges. So you can see how we're moving from yellow to orange to more of a red. Again, we want to keep this blend relatively soft. Going over it with as minimal amount of pressure as possible. There we go. Now, we have this base layer color and we're going back to it. So, take some of that, a little bit of our purple, a little bit of our red, and I'm trying to do all of this right now, wet into dry. You do not have to do that. 
or sorry, wet into wet. You do not have to do that. You can do wet into dry. It means things will probably look slightly less smooth, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing. We're going to add a lot of texture and detail in here, but I know a lot of people do like to work wet into wet, so I thought I'd show you that process because we will be doing wet into dry work as it will be kind of mandatory in a minute. So yeah, we'll definitely be doing both, but just recognize that you don't have to work as quickly as me. You don't have to make it all blend together initially. You can do the blends as they start to dry and that is a-okay. With that, I like that transition. Now we need to mix up the darker pigment. More Mars Black, more purple, again, red, less titanium white. I am grabbing a little bit of yellow because our color is diluted, but there's not really much we can do about that aside from getting more paint. And at this point, the time it would take is probably not worth it. There we go. Oh, I like that even more than our previous color. Good. Very good. Okay, this is starting to dry, so I'm going to make my brush damp, quite damp, not wet, but quite damp, as that'll help me blend into our previously now drying pigment. Yeah, going in quite soft. There we go. We can do a little tap, further pronounce this movement in the road. Yeah. Okay, so that <laughs> actually worked out really, really well. Again, doesn't have to be done all wet, but it can be, and there's an example of it. Though our road still doesn't have much detail at all, and we will be incorporating that quite soon. Just going to soften a couple things while I can blend this side and this side into each other here at the end. There's a, a bit of an interesting movement in the road in the reference photo, and I'm not going to be doing this bottom part, but I am going to do the larger reflection. I just wanted to keep it a little bit more simple, a little less visually complicated. That is an artistic liberty that I'm taking just because I, I think it'll aid the aesthetics of the piece. But so far, that looks great. Let's go to our titanium white. And our yellow makes up the brightest yellow we have thus far. Get a little bit more. A little bit more titanium white. Head back here and thicken this up because it will look significantly better when thick. And this is where we are forced to paint wet into dry because this is already dried. And there just there wasn't a world where we would be able to make it back up here in time while it was still wet. So I'm just doing very light, very thin applications along the edges, lifting my brush off so I don't get a hard edge. And it's just a very natural transition of paint. There we go. That worked out well. Now, uh, I can see on my reference photo that we have this yellow, this light, that's going to move down here. There's a line. And you know what? I can already tell this is still slightly wet, and it's difficult to apply paint to. I think we should also go in with a bit more of a red for the base. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to let this dry. We're going to look at our reference photo. We're going to talk about why for this reflection of yellowish gold, we're not going to go in initially with the yellowish gold, and then we'll go and apply the correct color. So I will see you in just a second. So I'd like to start this process by noting that I am switching to the filbert brush because I want a softer blended head now that the majority of this is dried on our painting, right? We can't use the hard sharp corners of the regular half inch flat headed brush. So now that we have this and we look at this area, we can see that we have all of this yellow, which I think one would naturally assume we could just apply. However, if you look 
every time we get closer to the gray in the painting, there's this transition, not of yellow, but of orange. It's always yellow into orange and this warmish, pinkish gray that maybe has a little bit of purple, right? And we can't really put the yellow on top of the gray because then you get more of a muddy color, right? Because that gray, if it has purple in it, has a little bit of blue in it. So we kind of use the orange as a transitionary color that looks natural, which we can then layer the yellow on top of or the yellow into. So with that, we're going to mix more of the orange that we have right there. It's a great color. Grab some of our yellow, titanium white. My palette's still a little bit messy here. I'm starting to run out of space, admittedly, but that's okay. And right there, wow. <laughs> we uh, Okay, so we, we found the color. That was very quick, that was very easy. The more you do your paintings, the faster that'll kind of start to happen for you, just because you'll be more familiar with your ratios and your colors. I think we're at the point in this lesson where mixing is getting to be quite a bit more simple. And we're going to use this, by the way, for a lot of the details that we have in the foreground. So make sure that you do leave a little bit of this on your palette to remix later. And you might even want to take it and just move it to an entirely different spot for just general reference. With that, we're going to head back into the painting with this. So what's really neat about what we're about to endeavor in is we did all of that wet into wet, but what we need to do now is wet into dry. And if you had real struggles with doing all of this in the way I was doing it before, if you just don't feel like you're ready to paint that quickly yet, this is what you can do instead, okay? So we're going to start by applying the color that we know we need. We're going to apply it in the general movements that I see in the reference photo. Comes down to this line. This line still is going to be present, so we'll leave that be. It'll connect into the orange that we have up here. And then there's a bit of a strange movement <laughs> occurring here in the reference photo that I'm actually not going to include. So I'll just continue that line down here. So now we have that applied. As you can tell, it's all for the most part, a very sharp application, which isn't necessarily what we want, right? We want it to blend. We wanted all of this to blend. So how do we make that happen with the background being dry? Well, first we make our brush quite damp and then might grab the smallest hint of paint, very little, take the majority of it off, just so we have something to work with. And then I'll go to the edges, and I'll drag the paint towards the area of negative space, and I'll lift my brush as I go about it, and this will soften that edge, and give us a bit of a gradient and a blend. Now, if it started to dry, the new application that is, that's when the new paint comes in handy because you can redefine that edge that was sharp before. Now we've covered that up, we've extended it, and we're blending with that new pigment, making it a bit softer, just like that. I'm going to grab slightly more water. You don't want to use too much water though because if you use too much, you create a space where paint can't really attach to the canvas and you have to wait for it to dry. It's completely remediable, but again, you have to wait an extra five to 10 minutes. So we're going to avoid that. We're not going to make the brush too wet, or at least we're going to attempt not to. And we're just going to continue to blend this orange outwards a little bit, creating a safe base for the yellows we intend to incorporate. So you can see just how soft that's getting we can do it down here as well. Again, this is fully dried, so we're essentially using new paint to create the gradient. Go back, grab more, take more off. And every time I do this, I'm extending this out a little bit. So I recommend starting with a slightly smaller application than what you think you'll actually need. And you know what, we can extend to this, just make it warmer. Looking at the reference photo, noticing that this area is a little bit brighter actually. 
So here again is just how we do the blend wet into dry. Nice and easy. Not too difficult at all. I realized that in that process I, I was probably working a little frantically and I, I wanted to articulate the fact that you don't have to work that way at all. I, I really want to stress that. There are multiple ways of going about acrylics. Sometimes it's, you know, very uh, wet into wet, sometimes it's wet into dry, sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's wholly on personal preference and you can do an entire painting wet into wet for the most part or wet into dry. All of these techniques, uh, there are different ways of working around them. So with that, now that we have that applied and it's fairly dry to the touch, we can grab more of our yellow, more of our titanium white. That looks beautiful, warm, bright. Start it right up here. And we can see that it starts to work its way down. This is what we initially tried to do when we had more of the warm gray background. I'm going to skip a little bit of an area there. We're also going to soften the edges. So I'm just doing a slight little very soft tap around the bottom areas. I'm going to keep the top to be relatively sharp, for now at least. This is only layer one, we will need to build this up. Because right now the pinks and oranges are showing through, but that's okay. So now we have that applied, now we go to soften, so I'm going to the edge, very lightly, moving to the right, relieving pressure. There we go. Let's get you a little bit closer. So at this distance, I think it becomes quite evident just how semi-transparent all of this pigment is, and that is just how working with acrylics is, but that's not a bad thing at all. That semi-transparent nature is letting us get this soft blend that we are right now. So you can see I'm just working towards my edge, I'm slowly relieving pressure, and I'm getting that wet and dry look that I really, really like. We'll head over here, do the same. Head over here, do the same. There we go. Again, alleviating so many of those hard edges. Now we can go back, grab more titanium white, brighten up that mixture. Redefine this. I, I like the fairly definitive sharp edge on the top here, almost exclusively. We go into the middle, we go into the middle, we go into the middle. Now I'm going to take a lot of that excess paint off my brush, make sure that it's nice and damp. We'll go back in for our wet into dry blending because the base layer has now dried. We'll just blend that out. There we go. Still a lot of detail to add down here, but it's starting to come together. And it definitely still needs another layer. But it's a little wet right now to add said layer. So we're going to take a break from that. And I'll have some fun here. Let me grab a different brush. Here we have our liner brush, right? Grab some of this highlight. I'm going to go off to the edge and start working these little horizontal lines for the road. This is something that's really going to make this look gorgeous from a distance. They start by coming out of that really light area. You 
can do this on both sides. You can even show how the road warps with them. So this kind of comes up and then comes back down. So my strokes even kind of visually follow that idea. They're moving up and then they're doing a little bit of a round and then they're coming down. Lots of little taps. I know I'm getting a little bit quiet through this, but it's just one of those things that's so relaxing, easy to sink into. Again, one of my favorite parts of this painting process. You can also see that we're occasionally moving farther out. And this will look a lot better once the middle is really defined as something quite bright, or rather, the brightest area. Continuously getting more water and paint. There we go. We'll also do this with some of the orangey reds that we have in a little bit. So you don't want to do too, too much with this. As we get towards the middle and back area. But you can do little hints. As I am right here. Now, as you can see in the reference photo right through here, not only do we have the oranges and the yellows starting to work their way out to the right, we also have the more warm grayish pigments working their way over. So we're going to mix a bit more of that. We have our titanium white, our Mars black. We've done this quite a few times at this point. So we'll mix all of that together. It's very close to what we have here and here. So it should be a relatively good match, though apparently it's far too dark. And perhaps what we had there was for something else. So more titanium white, make that a bit brighter. Give it a test. And that looks like it matches our previous color splashes. So we'll work with this and we'll see how it goes. So now we're back at the canvas. We have our smaller liner brush yet again, and we'll grab some of that pigment. I'm going to start working from the gray that we have off to the side. And as you can see, it matches the nice highlighted pigment of the gray quite well. We'll start working that in here. The value is incredibly similar to what we have for the orange, and that's making it blend optically quite well. I really like that effect. It shows that everything that's occurring is quite natural color-wise, the fact that it doesn't stand out greatly, and it's going to be this really beautiful, subtle, probably for the most part, subconscious detail. There we go. Again, working from the side, adding this gray detail to the melting ice. Really like how this is starting to turn out. Definitely coming together the way we want. And this goes to show, I really like to touch on this fact, this really goes to show that if your initial blend for the background wasn't perfect, that is okay because we are covering it up to a great extent with other applications. And these can cover very specific areas that you don't love. So again, don't ever worry about it not going perfectly. We can always repaint, we can always retry, and we can even layer on top of later on. So all is well, just remember to have fun and enjoy the process. Sometimes you will have to paint a little bit more quickly, but you know, that's uh, that can also be fun. I, I enjoy the challenge often, um, especially knowing that if I don't like it, I can just cover it up and try again. So we'll throw those in there, grab this, 
And I think we'll do a little bit over here, particularly coming out of these highlights. Just create a little bit more visual interest right along this edge. It's essentially at this point a lot of negative space. We are going to have the reflection of a larger bush in this general area, but that doesn't mean that we can't add any detail for the road. There we go. Leaving that larger open area for now just because I didn't want to make it too uniform. I like having some areas that have more, some that have less. It just makes the space as a whole more captivating. There we go. Okay, now the next step is something I just realized when looking at the reference photo and I think is quite interesting. So, we left this darker area in between the road, right? But in the reference photo, I realized that the middle portion of it is actually raised. So we can go in and add this actual, like really finite, beautiful detail. I wouldn't have thought about it had I not seen it in the reference photo, but with that, we'll grab some of our yellow, some of our red. We want to mix up a red dominant layer to begin with. Remember, we don't start with the yellow because we don't want muddy pigments. Now I'm going to take my pinky finger, ground it on the easel. I'm working in between that and that. It's arguably a little bit too saturated, I will admit. At which point we have the option of moving that saturated pigment out to both sides to normalize it a little bit. And we can also go over it with something that's less saturated. But we are in the foreground, so I'm not really all that hesitant to incorporate more saturation. And I'll even apply it a little bit more on this side just to further define both of those edges. So now we'll clean our brush, we'll mix up a lighter pigment and we'll go in. Admittedly, this will go a little bit more smoothly if you give it time to dry, but I think we're okay. Specifically because it's such a small area and we can just be very controlled with our application. With that said, just looked over at the time and I think it's safe to say that we are past the halfway point in our lesson. I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you for just spending this time here with me today working on something that hopefully makes us all proud, happy, it's enjoyable, it's cathartic, it's relaxing. I feel like these are all different things that I get out of the painting experience. And I hope that you find a couple of them as well. Painting, it can just be so rewarding. If you take your time and you relax, you enjoy the process, and again, I, I very much appreciate that you're here, taking the time, working on this, keeping this classical medium alive. You know, in, the, in a day of digital art, which by the way, I very much am also fond of, but it's just, it's really nice that we are still working with physical mediums. With that, I'd also as per usual, I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody who is up over on the Patreon supporting the channel. Let's try to say this every week, but I really, really couldn't do what I do if it wasn't for you. This channel is predominantly fan funded, and in no world would I be able to spend the time making these, doing multiple versions sometimes, redoing skies. For the record, I redid this, uh, this painting and this sky. Uh, three times before the one that you are currently watching. But again, in no world would I be able to do that, lay out the lessons, break things down into steps. If it wasn't for you and the support, I'd, I'd be off having to do other things. So thank you for allowing me to teach. Thank you for allowing me to provide these lessons for everybody else, for everybody who you know can't afford traditional art lessons. I, I went to university for fine art and I can tell you it was uh, not, not inexpensive. 
So thank you for, again, just providing this opportunity for all of us, myself included. I hope that you very much enjoy the lessons, the traceables, the reference photos, all of the, the polls, the, the bonus content I try to get up there for you. But, you know, it's a new year. First real lesson of the new year, and I just, I wanted to start it with a big thank you. It's amazing that I get to do this and just get to teach. It's pretty incredible. Also, I suppose for those of you who are new to the channel, perhaps this is your very first lesson here, you can also support the channel up over on Patreon. There's a link in the description and up there. You can get a bunch of really cool bonus content, like all of the traceables, to help with the drawing process, the reference photos to help with color matching, like what I've been doing all lesson. You can also get access to our polls where we vote on future lessons, and you can get access to all of my eBooks, including Acrylics for Beginners, where we essentially talk about the essentials, everything you need to know about your acrylic painting before we jump into our acrylic painting. In there, we talk about composition, glazing, blending, what brushes to use, how to use water, how to mix our colors appropriately so that we get the right blends. Really, again, just everything you need to know before you jump into your first acrylic painting. We also have a bunch of ebooks full of traceables for the days where you want to create something but you're not really sure what you want to create. Bunch of really fun things up there. And again, it all goes to support the channel, make things like this happen. It's also worth noting that we have a, an exclusive Facebook group where you guys can post your artwork, talk about it with a community who is also working on very similar pieces, kind of get ideas and help from one another. I try to pop in when I can. I, I'm generally pretty busy, but I do try to pop in and help out when I can. So if you are a member up over on Patreon, you know, might be might be something you want to check out. Here we're just going back and brightening up the middle, as you can see. We really wanted to build this layer, make it nice and thick. Generally, thick layers and thin layers are a very <laughs> uh, initially obvious way of telling how long someone's been painting for. Generally, when we're new to painting, we're a bit more hesitant to really layer things on. And when someone's been painting for a couple of years, you can see those very opaque applications. You can see colors underneath, but never canvas underneath. And so, especially in an area like this, in the foreground, that's something we are very much focusing on right now. Just building that up appropriately, making it look as good as we possibly can. But with that, I think this is turning out really, really nicely. I don't think I want to do too much more with these colors specifically. Maybe we'll come back later on in the lesson, but it's important to recognize that you don't always want to make every de area hyper detailed because if you do, you're kind of forced into making other areas hyper detailed. So we're going to leave this, I think, as is for now. And then if we feel like we need to go back in and add more detail, we will. But that'll happen later. And again, later, <laughs> I do try to overdo everything just a little bit. That way I can walk it back and figure out exactly where things are. So a couple of different ideas there, but they do all kind of fit together when sequenced. I said I was going to stop, but it's just, it's so much fun. It's really hard to stop this process. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very cathartic. I don't want to do too much detail here like this in the background though because it's just it's too far away to really see that detail. So, you know what? I'm going to stop that for now. I say that and I say one more area. Just want to add a slight highlight in between here like we did there. Have a bit of our orange still in the palette. Very subtle, but quite nice. And with that, I think we are probably going to paint in the little area that I took out, actually. Yeah, that's what I should do next. And then we'll work on the next subject. So I'll probably just put a little bit of music in the background while I work on this. And then we'll jump, uh, we'll jump into the next step together.
So I initially thought that I would put music over this portion, but I thought, you know what, in retrospect, this is a great opportunity to just go over yet again what the entirety of the process is, that way we remember and retain it. So I went in there with the liner brush and just worked with our darker base layer, again fairly purple, that way it's nice and cohesive. Then once it's dry, I'm switching over to my filbert brush so that I can cover a bit of a larger area. We go in with a more so desaturated middle of the road orangey beige and then we can slowly build up our highlight and saturation on top of that. I have now switched back to the smaller liner brush so that we can use more detail and then as we get again farther away from us I decide to add more orange because there's going to be more of that warm light and we slowly build that up as we get closer to us we are going to let that, you know, start to fade out. We're going to have a bit of a gradient. We're not going to use as much, and that's going to create some additional depth, which is really nice. Then I go and grab quite a bit of our cadmium yellow uh, deep U quite a bit of our titanium white. I really figure out where the sun is coming down again, and then I apply this highlight to that area with a little bit of a tap and drag, but not so much so that we create too much detail because I can remember the farther away you get, the harder it is to really see that detail in real life. And we want to ensure that we are continuing that idea in the back here. So there's a little bit of a shimmering, there's a little bit of detail, but not too much. So now it's time to head on to a new subject, though we'll probably return to this in a little bit. Now we're going to start working on all of these little pieces right here, what we have in the background right there. They'll all essentially use very similar values and the same type of application. So. We start by grabbing quite a bit of Mars Black, and as you can see, I have the one inch flat headed brush and quite a bit of Mars Black now on the reference photo, but that's okay. We'll apply that to the canvas or to the palette. We'll grab some of our deep violet. We'll grab a hint of our titanium white, not too much, just enough to brighten the Mars Black to the point where you see the slightest hint of purple, and this might not really come across well on camera, but it's something you can account for in your work. And I'm using this large brush right now, not because I'm going to use it to apply our pigment, but because I want to mix a lot of this paint, and the larger the brush, the easier that is. So now that I have that, let's switch brushes and head to the canvas. So we're going to start here using the liner brush. Again, very, very small tip, but great for detail work. We'll ensure that it's damp. We'll grab some of our pigment. We'll use our pinky finger to ground our hand, ensuring that we don't have a lot of shake. And we'll just create all of these little bushes in the background. We're going to want to ensure that they're always changing, that we have a varying amount of space in between each of them and that they are nice and small. So we are applying as little amount of pressure as possible and we don't have much pigment on our actual brush. The more pigment you have on your brush, the more opportunity it has to kind of create a larger mass which is difficult to paint with. You can see that the spacing is getting very similar and that's an issue. So I'm going to combine these two right here and I think that definitely worked well. For the most part, I'm trying to paint it so it looks like they're going behind these mounds, but you can also, with the really prominent ones, move some in front as well. We'll skip some space here. We'll skip a lot of space. And then we'll do a larger cluster of them. That said, it's much easier to apply these than it is to take them away. So I recommend initially going in with less and then slowly adding. Also, while I do have the general rule of adding too much and then working backwards, this is an area where you can probably gauge if it's too much before you get there. So don't feel like you have to do that with every subject. It isn't always necessary more so of a, an end of painting sort of technique. I like to 
implement with areas I'm questioning. So, so far so good. Again, just a subtle little detail for the background. You can see that now I'm starting to work my way in more. There we go. I think that looks great. Okay, so now we're going to pull back and work on the larger bush. So I'm personally going to freehand this and just look up at the reference photo, though, again, you are more than welcome to redraw it in or use the traceable or use the reference photo or go back to the start of the video to see where things were drawn. That said, I don't think I drew this in the initial image. I, I think I just noticed it. So I'm working this in. It's essentially coming from behind this mound of snow. So I'm trying to start essentially at the same point on the bottom here, though if I become a little uneven with it, it's not the biggest deal because we can always just kind of come back and kind of make that top area a little bit more prominent. But that's essentially the size of each of our applications. And I know, yet again, we're painting from a bit of a distance. That is intentional. I think only at a distance will you really notice if we're doing too much or too little. So this is all coming out of the larger bank of snow. The larger body of it is inside. These are all just protruding. As I'm closer to the top here, I do try and have them more vertical. But as we get towards the bottom, I kind of have them move out more horizontally and then move upwards slightly. As you can see, here we're overlapping portions of our path, which I think looks quite interesting, definitely adds additional depth. We're going to add these to the point where the middle section is going to be, for the most part, the singular dark value with slight occasional openings. I know I said initially that I wanted to keep us at a bit of a distance so we could really monitor the amount that we have in here, but something started to happen that I wanted to really take note of and it's only really addressable when we are up close. A lot of these, as you can probably tell, have the canvas really creating this jittery effect, this toothy effect in the painting. That's something we want to attempt to avoid and doing that means using a bit more water on your brush. So while the pigment may be more thin, like this, we're able to kind of move in all of the little granular areas. So just something I'd recommend. We can go back over these areas, fix them up. It's not really an issue, but it'll make your life easier if upon the first application, you don't have all of those little opening areas there. You see that? Fix that really easily. When you start to run out of water, it'll be harder to accomplish. There we go. Make sure that your prominent areas are crisscrossing to a point. That'll look at, make it look a lot more natural. And then we're going to move back a little bit, start a second one. And this will overlap with this to a fair extent. 
having it move out from varying areas of the snowbanks. Now we need to start crisscrossing some of them. I'm going to try to make this area a little bit less dense with all of our little branches. That way it's still distinguishable that there are two predominant bushes in this area. There we go. You can also create little offshoots for these branches once you have the majority of them in there the way you want them to be. This would be a nice added detail. You're going to want to do it predominantly on the ones that are more so individual and stand out to a point. Now that we're a little bit farther back, we're going to take that same pigment, that same brush, look at these and say, okay, you know what, down here in the reflection, let's do it. So now, doing the exact same thing, however, I'm going to avoid the brighter orangey areas, which, by the way, you can just paint on top of this if you happen to cover it up, so don't worry too much, but we're going to start implementing all of these little lines down here and create a nice reflection. This is watery ice. We are going to have an eclectic mix of visuals down here. I think that's going to make it just so much more interesting. There we go. Starting with that one. Dancing around some of these highlights. Just doing a little tap here or there. Really focusing. Some portions of this I like to be very loose and just kind of have fun with it. Other times uh, I like to really take in the area, figure out where we need new applications, consider why we need them, that's also important. You know, does an area have too much negative space? Is it not full enough? Does it look too similar to another one? Is there something we want to specifically move on top of or cover up? There are a lot of different scenarios there. So this is reflecting that. I think the base needs to be a bit darker. And I think we could use a couple of strays that are nice and thin. There we go. I think I like this a lot. Yeah. Okay. So, so far so good. Love when that just works out. I think we'll Go in and add some little spin-off branches, pieces that protrude from the pre-existing ones. Not going to do too many. I'm going to make them extra small, apply even less pressure. And just like that, I think we have a nice little reflection. So, now it's time to start working on the tree, which I am going to sketch back in because it's quite large and I just want to ensure that it's in the relatively correct place. So now we're going to start working on these larger trees right here. I am going to mix up more of that pigment with the one inch flat headed brush because again, we do want to mix up quite a bit at once, though we will switch to a smaller brush for the actual application. With that, I am mixing a slightly darker mixture than what I used for the bushes because this is slightly closer to us and therefore will be a little bit more stark. I think that looks great. 
Let's give it a test. Looks great. Let's head on over to the canvas. Now, for the actual application, I'm switching back to the half inch flat headed brush because it'll give us slightly more control than the one inch. We'll grab that pigment and I'll start working along the drawn edges of our tree. Now, a lot of people, I think, like to approach this and create these very long strokes. I very much like to make minor strokes and connect them. And I do this very specifically so that we get all of these very organic, natural looking bumps throughout the tree. I don't want it to look pristine. I don't want it to look perfect. To me, that doesn't look natural. And trees generally have a lot of pieces which make them individual. So we are going to ensure that we interject those. And I find the best way to do that is to do so with a lot of little strokes rather than singular long ones. I'm also starting by making our branch as small as possible initially, and then I expand and make the edges wider because it's a lot easier to make the edges wider than it is to make them smaller. Let's get you a little bit closer for the top though. So from here, we're going to look for that drawing. And again, you can go back to the start of the video to see where the drawing is placed, or if you're up over on Patreon, you can use the traceable or reference photo to help you out. But I'm essentially starting with the larger branches initially. As we get towards the smaller ones, I'm applying even less pressure with my brush so that they get smaller and smaller. That way it looks nice and natural. And now we'll move over to a larger one yet again, making those strokes, doing a slight drag, ensuring that we get smaller and smaller as we move up. And the branches don't just move up, sometimes they move down, like what you can see happening here, just using the corner to craft some additional details. And that is far too large, so I'm just going to use my finger, take that off really quick before it has a chance to dry. We can paint over that later with the sky color if we want. Now that it's nice and thin, it won't really make much of a difference. And here you can see I'm just tapping on little branches as well. There we are. So far so good. Going to make sure my brush is nice and damp. Grab more of our pigment. And this is actually connected to a different branch that we are currently crafting. Now we are just working on the larger ones currently, but we're going to do probably a couple hundred smaller ones as well in the near-ish future. I'm also going to take an artistic liberty here. I didn't have a larger branch drawn in this spot, but I kind of like the movement and I wanted to continue that. Grab some more water, grab some more paint. There we go. Work that upwards. When I get to the really small areas, I do move entirely to a tap and there isn't a drag because when you drag, you generally have to apply some level of pressure into the canvas, which does expand the bristles on your brush, which is something we are actively working to avoid. There we go. Some of these, by the way, because they're as watery as they are, are a bit more thin than I'd really like them to be. And that's important to recognize because you may have to go back and do additional layers. But again, additional layers aren't a bad thing. Now at this point in this area, I think I've essentially done all that I can with this brush. And it's time to start working with something a bit more delicate. So here we are now a little bit lower. I've switched to the liner brush, same one we used for all of these. And we'll grab some of our abundant paint that we have. Now I'm going to start 
on the end of these branches and work my way in. We talked about why at the start of the lesson. Ask yourself now why that might be the case, just as a little refresher. The answer, again, is just that when we go to apply the paint to the canvas, we can go in with the smallest amount of pressure and we have an abundant amount of paint to move around. But as you run out of paint, as the water and the brush starts to run out, you have to apply more pressure. When you do that, the bristles expand and you get a larger application. So we start at the top so we can get the smallest application possible. If we were to start at the bottom and then work our way to the top, things might be a bit more difficult because Sorry, this is <laughs> just something I do want to focus on. Um, because as we run out of paint, as we move towards the top, we'd have to expand and it just wouldn't be a natural movement for the branch. Now I am trying to keep these all fairly unique. I've grounded my hand against the canvas to eliminate shake. We're going to do a lot of these in this lesson to the point where I'll probably speed up a little bit of the footage just so it doesn't get too repetitive. But I've gone ahead and drawn this all in with Conte, which is essentially a colored chalk, which I like to use as it does come off with water. It doesn't normally dilute pigment and it's just a, a great medium in general. I do want some of these kind of crisscrossing to show that they're three dimensional. So I'll create that little movement there. I think that looks quite nice. Follow this down here. Starting to apply more pressure with my brush because we are getting to a point where this can start to expand. Yeah, okay, so I'm looking at the drawing and it definitely does expand here. And it even connects to a secondary branch as well. So, let's grab some paint. And this one actually doesn't just move up. Remember, branches can move in a wide variety of directions. If you want to look natural, it's important to incorporate most all of them. Now here, I am kind of going against my general rule of starting at the end of a branch, but if you're careful enough and you have enough water on your brush, you can, you can end on a sharp application, though eventually I know I will kind of mess up and apply more pressure. So I'm going to be very sparing with those types of applications when I feel they are necessary. So we'll go back to doing things in the way that I feel is more so technically correct. Though however, and I think this is very important, just because I advise a certain technique, application, color, whatever it may be, doesn't mean it's the definitive way of doing it. Creating art is very personal and I really want you to feel like you can create art in the way that you want to and that my ideas or my preferences don't kind of handcuff you in the same way I don't want the reference photo to. Create the way you want to create, create what you want to create. All of these lessons, all of these tools are there to act as tools, which you can use if you'd like, but do not have to. These lessons are made for you to enjoy yourself, to have fun, to learn, to spend a good afternoon creating something, not not to tell you exactly how you have to do something. It's never the goal here. So, while I like to start at the tops for the most part and work my way down, you do not have to. Sometimes, just because of the orientation one has to be in when they're painting, it may be more beneficial to start and then work your way to the bottom like we did here. And if you do find yourself in that area, in that scenario, I don't want you to feel bad about it. Especially if you find it's the most convenient 
approachable way of going about it. We have rules, but we have reason to break rules. There we go. So far, I really like these. I think they look natural. I think they look unique. I think we can add to them, but I think it's a great base. Starting strong. There we go. I don't think I want to do too, too much in terms of the larger, thicker bases here, but I will do a number of these smaller branches. There we go. I did a weaving effect here, which was very similar to that, which was unintentional, but it is important to recognize when you have common applications, that way you can avoid doing the same thing over and over again. Here, I'm creating another piece that moves down, but I'm trying to avoid making it look exactly like that one. So we'll flare it at the bottom rather than having it so close and centered like that. We'll create an additional offshoot. That'll kind of get lost. Again, this is very subtle, as it is meant to be. Now we're going to take a little bit of a break from that bottom area and start working on the top. That way we can ensure that we don't kind of do too much down there and force ourselves to do too much on the top. And the same rule applies to our clouds and really everything else you've been working on. Now I'm still using that very small little liner brush and as we move down our branch we do try to you know alleviate that pressure create something even smaller. The brush is quite damp at this point so it's watery it's a little semi-transparent and that isn't a bad thing it's going to mean that it gets more subtle and that's actually great. Now, as I get towards the top here, I decide to start coming back down. We are crisscrossing for, you know, one of the first times that really is important. I can't stress that enough because the branches, they don't just grow to the right and left. They also grow in front, behind. They start to do these more dynamic movements which wrap around each other. Sometimes they actually connect. And all of those little intricacies definitely build up into something that's natural and realistic. So we are trying to work that into the painting. The more you do these, by the way, I think the more you control, you'll start to render, the more confident you'll be. And that's great because we start with the larger branches where you have more room to kind of mess up because they are meant to be large and you can expand them to the left or the right if you need to, where with these, you do want to really make them quite small. Now, if you accidentally and make an area too big, you can quickly try to take that off. You grab another brush, you add some water to it, you apply that brush to that area, then maybe you wipe it off with your hand, a painting cloth or paper towel. Alternatively, you could also just create a much larger branch to then go and move on top of it a little bit later on, and maybe one that does that over a couple of different areas. So again, don't worry too much about it. There are ways of working around it, though that is probably what I'd recommend with such a complicated sky visually because we'd have to go back and remix a lot of colors to cover up the branches with the sky as we are working with a pretty diverse backdrop. Now, I'm going to have a lot of fun with the upcoming branches. They are going to take quite a drop, and that's something you want to consider. Branches, again, they don't always grow straight upwards, and a lot of these dropping motions can be great to create leading lines. They draw the eye back down in the painting towards the sky, towards the actual road, and that's fantastic. It's subtle, it's not in your face, it's something that does aid the composition in a very 
uh, warm way and I like that a lot. So this is something I definitely recommend though as I get towards the ends, I like to do this little movement that comes back up. It implies that the weight of the branch has kind of brought it back down and then there's an offshoot which is small. It doesn't have a lot of weight and it can move and it's kind of reaching for the sky. I love that look and it's something I'm going to do fairly frequently throughout this process. Also, once I have a lot of these larger branches implemented, I go back in and I apply smaller branches to those as well. Now here, my hand is going to cover it a little bit. We're at a bit of an awkward angle, though with that noted, we want to ensure that our branches aren't just kind of creating these offshoots towards the middle of the painting. We want to ensure that they are also going to exist and move back behind the larger branches which we have to the left hand side. So there is a lot of branches we are going to be crafting and I'm, I know that the outskirts is the most important area visually because it's going to be more visually prominent. We're going to have more open space for it to stand out on. So I start with that and I try to figure out how much of it I want. Then once I feel like I'm at a good amount, I work my way back more so into the, words, the middle of the tree. I fill that in to about an equal extent. And then I ask myself, okay, does the tree have enough branches? And if the answer is yes, then fantastic and we move on. If the answer is no, which for the record, normally it is, we go back towards the outskirts and we start to fill that area out yet again. We give it some extra detail, those very small branches, the ones that hook upwards, the ones that dive back down low. And then I say, okay, you know what? Do I like that? Yes, let's move back towards the middle. We fill that out. We take our steps back. We say, as a whole, do we like it? And, you know, it's very much this process of just going back and forth like that. And eventually you're going to have something where you say, you know what? That is enough detail. I like that a lot. I think that's done. So that's essentially what I'm doing and you can kind of see the pattern in the process, but it's a great way of ensuring you actually get enough branches and you don't kind of lock yourself into too, too many in one area or another and therefore force yourself to do too many in another area as well. So this really is a fun, cathartic part of the process. I love working on branches and <laughs> we started the painting off with arguably the hardest subject in the sky and all of those colors. So at this point we kind of do get to relax and just enjoy painting this single hue application. The value it doesn't change, the color doesn't change. It's really just creating line and having fun with the general movements. I'm also still, as you can see, for the most part, using my pinky finger to ground my hand on the canvas. That way I eliminate shake from my hand and ensure that we really aren't going to have any issues with unintentional <laughs> stray applications. I'd also like to remind you, as I generally do, Make sure that you're taking little breaks, that you're having water, that you're having food. I find often when I'm not doing that, I get a little bit shaky and it definitely affects my painting. I get less patient. So make sure you're taking care of yourself. Maybe take a little break, have some tea, maybe have, a, again, a, a bite to eat. That definitely makes the painting process a whole lot more enjoyable for me. And it's great to just, you know, look out for yourself. Make sure you're staying safe. Make sure you're staying healthy. That's also important. So yeah, just a, a friendly little reminder mid painting lesson, but definitely something that can actually impact uh, the painting process itself. With that, we are really starting to expand. You can see that we have a lot of branches and I'm getting to the point where I'm actually very happy with what we have here. We are going to add in some additional elements later on to interject some depth into this, but for the base layer, for a singular value, which is void of depth because it's void of gradients, I think it looks great. And all of the crisscrossing is natural. Though I would like to remind you, for the most part, I did a lot of the dropping branches out towards the right hand side of the tree, the open area. Make sure that you also do that in the middle of the tree. Looking back on this, I think that's one thing I could have done more. And I think it would have made it look a little bit better. I'm also now going in with a very watery application. You can see the lines are looking almost a little bit purple and I really love that look. It makes the branches look slightly more distant than others and does create some depth with a very limited palette. Yeah. 
So for our next step, we're going to head back to the half inch flat headed brush and we're going to start working on some of the snow that you see here right on the backs and larger limbs of our tree. Now the snow here is very much in shadow so we'll use a little bit of titanium white but not too much. We'll use a fair amount of our blue but an equal amount of our deep violet. We'll need to desaturate it greatly so we'll use some titanium uh, white with that Mars black. Those two mixed together to make more of a gray. And we'll give that a try. We'll just continue it down the tree, see if it looks like it makes sense. And it does. That actually looks really nice. I think it could be a hint more blue. Try that. Okay, so this is what we'll use and we'll head back to the canvas. So now when we go to apply our pigment, we're going to look for areas of the tree which could have snow fallen on it. So generally, they're going to be more flat, like what we have with this branch, or it's going to be on the leaning side that's facing upwards. So in this case, we're going to use our half inch flat headed brush. We're going to tap and then do a little bit of a drag occasionally, just creating different little patterns. You can move the snow up if you'd like to. But as you can see, it allows us to differentiate this tree from this tree. And that's pretty useful. We can also use the corner of our brush rather than the entire side if we want to work on something very detail oriented. And the one thing I'd really recommend through this process is ensuring that when you go over the edge of a branch, you don't have a little bit of that darker branch above the snow. Always make sure that the snow is touching the sky or the branch above it. But if you have the snow and then a little bit of that darker bark, the actual tree trunk, it's going to look a little unprofessional and just kind of like we didn't, we didn't spend as much time on it as we should. So just try to consider that when you're working on your trees and it should all turn out quite nicely. And we're not going to do this in too many areas actually, simply because there aren't going to be that many spots that could accumulate snow. And we're not going to do it on a lot of small branches because they themselves cannot accumulate a lot of snow. This is really just a fun little technique that can add a small amount of additional detail to your piece and create some markings here in the more silhouetted areas. So it's subtle, but it's nice. Makes this look a little more three-dimensional. And again, we don't have to do a lot of it. With that, let's talk about how we add highlights to our trees. So now using that same half inch flat headed brush, after cleaning it, we're going to look at all of the highlights that we have on the right hand side of the tree here. They are incredibly subtle, but you can normally see them where we have a darker value next to the tree. So here it's fairly prominent, you can see it right there too, but this is essentially a highlight from the sun and it's best applied, I find, with this brush. So we'll start by grabbing some titanium white some of our cadmium yellow medium hue, hint of our cadmium red. We'll mix that up and we'll go and test it. I think yet again, we found the right solution. So let's head to the canvas, start working on it. So when we were applying our snow, we were applying that predominantly to the left hand side and the tops. However, with this, We'll be applying it to the right hand side and it can even be on areas that are descending downwards. I'm going in with a bit of a tap and if I get some little speckles from the bristles, something a little inconsistent, that's actually great because it shows that there's some interesting little movements happening with the bark. We can apply it to the bottom of branches. We don't want to do too much though because it is quite stark. And it can be a little overwhelming 
if we apply it to every single branch. So I'm just taking my time, trying to find the best spots while again, not overdoing it. We can also put this on some of these smaller branches out here. Find that quite fun. There we go. All is well. Definitely a fun technique that can very quickly add an entirely new element to the painting. You can also use this to illuminate some of the branches that are more so in the shadows. You can see I'm being quite sparse with it. So now it's time for the next step, which is the final step, and that is touch-ups. Now, this is going to look quite different for just about everyone, but there are a couple of things that I think will be universal for all of us, and I do want to touch on them. So I'm going in with my Filber brush yet again. It has those softer edges, so it's great for blends. I want some titanium white, want a good amount of our yellow, hint of our red, mix up a nice, very bright orange, something that's slightly value-wise brighter than what we have here in the snow. And then I'm going to locate where the sun's going to be, which is essentially here, I can tell because I have the reflection right through our walkway. I'm going to say, okay, you know what? Let's add this highlight from that onto the snow. We can create multiple little mounds, but this is definitely an area that can pop and we can continue to bring the eye from here into here and just continue that general movement. There we go. Nice and easy. I'll softly go over the areas in between my strokes. And again, I know we're, we're quite far away from the actual painting, but when you're doing your touch-ups, I really think that's the best way to go about it. Because while you might be doing some detail work, for the most part, you're trying to bring the painting together, make it look nice and cohesive. And that's exactly what we're doing. And I want to ensure that the highlight that I add here still looks natural within the rest of the snow and with our general line work. There we go. Going over it for the most part fairly softly. Do a little finger painting. If you follow the channel, you know that's actually fairly regular. I'm a fan, okay. Going to take a couple of steps back. Make sure I like how that's looking. I do. So far, so good. Now, clean that brush off. And we'll fix up this area right here. So, I know that we had more of a purple pink in our snow. Mix that color up. need some Mars black because this was too similar. You can see that there are all of these little protruding pieces and they're all the same. So I'm going to connect a couple of them. There we go. Then we have this very small piece that extends and then it really starts to change. I think we'll also connect these two Sometimes, by the way, taking out detail, which is essentially what we're doing, does make the piece look better. Now I need more of an orange layer for the top, so we add some red and yellow. And just like that, we're able to bring it back. Make it a little more bright. There we go. 
It's a little change, but one that I think makes a big difference. That was something I've kind of been looking at throughout the entirety of the painting process, thinking, oh, I uh, really need to go back to that. <laughs> so I'm glad we were able to fix it as easily as you were able to. Now I'm cleaning my brush very well, applying a lot of water to it because I want to work with blue next and I don't want yellow on my brush to do so. So I'm going to grab some of our blue, I'm going to grab some of our white, Mars black. We're going to create a shadowy color for the foreground specifically in the snow, much like what we have here, but I want it to be a little bit brighter. So add more titanium white after we do a test. Go back in. Still needs to be brighter. Just doing some trial and error at this point. Go back in. And that is what we want. So, I'm going to apply this along the edge of this lighter shadowy snow area. I'll do a little bit of a blend into the pinks. I'll continue along this lip and I'll allow it to dissipate as we move up. I just want slightly more dimension in this area and this is a very easy way of going about it. Now we'll brighten yet again. More titanium white for the area. Good. We'll go back in, connect to the pink, follow the general lip, can dissipate as we get closer to us as we're moving farther away from the light. And you can have little areas that move up as well, but for the most part, we just want it to, as a whole, blend into the previous layer as you move towards the left. There we are. Nice and soft. I like that a lot. Okay, so, now that that's complete, I think we just kind of continue with little touch-ups of that same nature. Those were the big three that I think we all had to do. And now, again, just on to ourselves and whatever we find fun. So I thought I'd end this painting the way we started with a little bit of a voiceover. And again, I just I wanted to say thank you for being here, for joining me on this journey. I know this was quite a long painting. We covered a lot, and it also took me a couple of weeks to really get right. Sometimes, again, I do redo these a number of times. This was definitely one of them. Though I did decide to show you some of my larger mistakes and I intentionally remade a couple of them just so I could show you how to get out of them. Um, and I think that's I think that's important. Recognize that throughout this process, you can make mistakes, you can take artistic liberties, you can make it your own, you can have fun, you can redo things. Just enjoy the process, right? There's a lot to learn, there's a lot to enjoy, and that's so important. So I hope you have just as much fun as I do and that you feel like you really learn a lot through this because I feel like there are a lot of unconventional lessons and a lot of things that we're not normally used to dealing with. I mean, we have a very complicated sky in the background. We have a really neat icy yet watery reflection. We have all of these different values and hues and snows. I think when uh, a lot of people think of snow, they think of something that, again, is inherently an almost a titanium white. But here we have blue, purple, orange, pink snow, and it, it all works together. And I think it really articulates the fact that you can really build on your atmosphere when you are willing to interject hue into subjects which you don't inherently think have it. So, yeah, <laughs> definitely a lot to learn. Definitely a lot to have fun with. As per usual, I want to give you a keyword that you can use in the comments if you made it this far. This is something I love to do just to see who does frequently make it to the end of these videos. It's kind of a little badge of honor we have here on the channel. And it's a secret code word. I'll realize what it means. Everybody else in the comments who's also made it here will realize what it's mean. And it doesn't be, or rather, it doesn't have to be something that you use in a sentence. You can just put it in there or you can, you know, get creative with it and incorporate it into the sentence, but what word are we going to 
look for today. You know what? Let's keep it let's keep it very simple, very subtle, and almost a little counterintuitive. Warm. That's the word. It's obviously a very cool day out in the painting, but to me it's a very warm painting. It's something that brings me to a great place. I, I think it makes me happy, it makes me feel good, and it's warm to me, again, despite being a depiction of a, a cool winter landscape. So yeah, just find a way to work that into a, a sentence and I'll know and it'll be nice. But with that, I'd also like to say thank you for being here, taking this time. Again, always wonderful making these lessons with you and working through them too. Also, 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 <laughs> thank you to everybody who is up over on Patreon and directly supporting the channel, ensuring lessons like this can occur. As I, I talk about, this channel is predominantly fan-funded. I don't put ads throughout the lesson. I, I put one at the start, I put one at the end. But for the most part, if you watch other two-hour videos on YouTube, you'll see just a myriad of them, 20, 30. So that's something that I've always wanted to avoid. That's something I am able to because of you and because of the direct support up there. So thank you for making these lessons happen. Really wouldn't be able to put the time into them if it wasn't for you. And I, I, I try to say this at least once a lesson. I, I'd say it more if it didn't become repetitive or annoying, um, but it isn't lost on me just how, how great it is that I get to do what I do and that I get to because of you. So thank you for letting me make these lessons. Thank you for providing these lessons to everybody else out there on YouTube who maybe can't afford traditional art lessons. They're, um, <laughs> they're pretty expensive. And, you know, the fact that YouTube exists and something like this can exist is pretty wonderful. So thank you for making it happen. If you are new to the channel, then you can also support the channel directly up over on Patreon. I will have the link to it in the description. Up there you can get the reference photo for color matching as we've done throughout the lesson. You can get the traceable for working on the actual drawing process, getting all of those little details in there. You can get access to our exclusive Facebook group where everybody shares their work and renditions. You can kind of get ideas, ask for help. We have a really, really wonderful community. Uh, you can also get all my eBooks, including Acrylics for Beginners, which again is essentially the essentials. Everything you need to know about the acrylic painting process. Talk about blending, glazing, what brushes to use, how much water to use, how to blend, a, blend your colors, uh, composition, really, really everything under the sun. And you can also get a bunch of ebooks full of traceables. So there are a lot of really fun things up there. We just did a poll voting on the most recent uh, potential lessons. This one actually won, which is why we ended up painting it today. So there's a lot up there to check out if you'd like to, again, just say thank you and support the channel. But if you can't do that, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, there are a lot of really wonderful people uh, who do, and, and just because you can't doesn't mean that you're also not a, a wonderful member of the community. And regardless, I very much appreciate you and you being here. But with that, that is the painting lesson. So thank you. I hope you have a wonderful time. And above all, as always, stay creative. <laughs>